Um, he's going to be talking about some lessons from the past 10 years in global trade before talking about the outlook for this year and beyond. Uh, we're then going to hold a panel uh, looking at trade policy um, and the outlook for this year. That's going to be hosted uh, by Paul Grunwald, Chief Economist for S&P Global Ratings. Um, we're then going to have a panel, finally, uh, to look at technology in supply chains uh, in uh, looking forward. That's going to be hosted by uh, Warren Breakstone. Uh, he runs our data management services business. Um, there will be a chance for questions. Um, in the application, there is the facility um, to ask questions um, but, of course, the moderators will be calling upon you uh, and you can raise your hands as well and they'll be outlining the rules for that as we go along. Um, that's basically it. As a reminder, um, the application here has got all of the details on um, how to ask questions and polling and so on. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to call Josh up to the stage uh, to talk about um, the outlook for 2020. Thank you. Good luck, man. Good morning. Thank you all for coming, you uh, brave souls, uh, waking up so early to talk supply chain. Uh, appreciate it. Share your enthusiasm for supply chains. Um, thank you, Chris, uh, for the intro. Thank you for your leadership in uh, building Pangeva and uh, in helping people make sense of data. Uh, Chris called me. Uh, I, I love working with Chris. He called me a month ago and he said, you're giving the keynote and here's exactly what you're gonna say. I was like, okay, I can do this. So a lot of what you're, in fact, everything you're gonna see up here is data and, and insight that comes from uh, the research that our team does. And um, you know, of course, you know, I joke that it makes it easy for me, but, but really data at its best, this is what data should be doing. Right? It should be uh, making us all smarter, helping us all make better decisions. Uh, and so you know, that's what this morning's about. We're going to put some data in front of you, and then you're going to hear from people who know this data uh, really well uh, and um, hopefully help us make sense of something that's, that's really complicated. Uh, so you're going to hear from, uh, from some of the best in the world today. I'm excited uh, to hear from them myself. Uh, but first, let me run you through uh, some data. Uh, so we're going to do a couple things. One, talk about uh, the last 10 years, what, what, what we've just experienced. Um, look ahead to 2020 specifically and some of the items that uh, we're keeping an eye on and, and we would encourage you to keep an eye on. And then, uh, and then look a little bit further ahead and, and think about what the, the future holds uh, over a longer time horizon. So that's the plan. So looking back, uh, this, uh, this slide uh, walks you through uh, how trade has unfolded over the last decade. Uh, and this, for me, is very personal. Uh, I uh, uh, co-founded Pangeva, a company focused on trade, right before the Great Recession, when trade totally <coughs> collapsed. Uh, so any entrepreneurs who want tips on how to survive a deep recession, come see me after. Uh, I am happy to talk about it. Uh, but what was interesting was after the Great Recession, uh, trade recovered and recovered nicely. Um, if you look at, at the, the tens as a whole, uh, the numbers look pretty good. Uh, trade grew uh, on an annual basis north of 4%. Uh, but uh, but most of that is really in the first years of recovery. So if you take back the kind of immediate bounce back from the Great Recession, uh, trade growth was, was more anemic. It was uh, south of 1% annually. Uh, so um, kind of a mixed bag as you look back on the last decade. Uh, you may notice that in the middle of each of the graphs, there's a, a dip. That's 2015-2016. Uh, where there was a mini uh, trade recession um, that a lot of people have forgotten. I myself had forgotten. Chris reminded me of it. Um, and that was really uh, around um, the, the collapse of commodity prices. Uh, that's what, what uh, brought those numbers down. But it was kind of an interesting decade where you know, we saw 
uh, some big recovery. We saw a little dip. We kind of ended up in a place where global trade was you know, still reasonably healthy from an economic standpoint. Of course, politically, things are very interesting in the world of trade, and, and we'll talk about that uh, in a moment. Clearly, one of the, one of the big uh, stories, maybe the big story of the last decade and, and maybe the decades ahead is the rise of China. Uh, so, uh, you know, certainly when, when China uh, came into the WTO, uh, you know, it was, it was a big moment. I think what we've seen since then is um, obviously extraordinary economic growth, uh, which is, I, I think, um, phenomenal in terms of what it's done for the standard of living uh, of folks who have experienced it. It's also changed uh, the world in a, in a wide variety of ways. But very clearly, um, you, know, you can't uh, look at what's happened and, and look to the future without acknowledging that China is, uh, is a dominant power. So uh, certainly from an export standpoint, but increasingly from an import standpoint, the graph here shows you total trade flow. So this is exports plus imports. China has passed the US uh, and is right there uh, kind of going back and forth with the EU right now. So obviously um, there's big news in, in China these days with the coronavirus. Um, you know, that's, that's a story for right now, but the long-term story uh, is very clear, right? China uh, has risen as a, as a global power. Uh, now, interestingly, um, you know, as I think back to the early days of Pangeva, one of, the, one of the questions that we often got was, how do we get beyond China? Because you know, China has been a manufacturing powerhouse now for, for a while, and I think there's been a recognition that uh, by a lot of companies that they're too dependent on China, the, the, the risk is too concentrated, so how do we get beyond it was a question very much on the minds of people uh, a decade ago. And, uh, and what we saw was before, before uh, the current trade war got going, you saw signs of diversification beyond China. Uh, Vietnam, I think, has emerged as the clearest winner. Uh, we've seen uh, growth elsewhere. So that what this graph uh, is showing you is on the, um, the x-axis, it's showing you economic growth as a whole. On the y-axis, it's showing you uh, trade growth, growth and trade. So Vietnam has had both. Uh, and um, you know, it's, it's pretty impressive to see one of, the, one of the stories that has played out time and time again in trade has played out in Vietnam, where uh, countries, regions start with low value add uh, manufacturing and they start climbing the value chain. Uh, that has happened in Vietnam. It started with apparel, textiles, now electronics manufacturing has uh, taken hold. Um, so it's a, it's a real success story. And, and I think it's fair to say this was happening without uh, the, the trade conflict, without the, the political pressures that have emerged in the last few years. But I also think it's fair to say that political pressures have accelerated the push to diversify beyond China. Vietnam is, uh, is one clear winner so far. So, you know, that's what we've seen, kind of a, a mixed bag overall, clearly the rise of China, uh, efforts that have been somewhat uneven um, in terms of their results, but efforts to get beyond China. Uh, and that's, that's brought us to uh, the moment uh, that we're in right now. So what do we look for in 2020? Uh, you know, the story, in terms of US-China trade relations, it you know, feels like it, it changes by uh, the, uh, the month, if not the day. Um, you know, there was a phase one deal, which I think uh, people um, in the business community looked at with a sigh of relief. OK, you know, we're making progress in terms of finding a way to work together. Uh, there were some pretty significant commitments uh, by China to, to buy uh, more goods and services from the US. And I want to um, underline the services piece of this. Uh, this is not just about buying more commodities, more soybeans. This is, um, there were commitments to buy a, a pretty wide variety of things. And you know, it's one thing to place a big order for, um, for commodities, but to really ramp up the amount of services that you're purchasing, that's not something that you can just flip a switch and do. Uh, so it was going to be hard for China to fulfill 
uh, its commitments as part of the phase one deal. And now, you know, given the coronavirus and the uncertain impact that that's going to have, I think, if anything, it's going to become harder. Now, how does this actually play out? Uh, you know, unclear because, you know, arguably you've seen um, the U.S. and China starting to, to uh, work even harder to work in a more collaborative way uh, to confront um, the, the, the health challenges that, that we face now. Um, maybe that leads to even better trade relations. But, you know, I, my take is if you take the long view, I think the rise of, of China as an economic power is something that is going to be um, at the center of the political discussion here for some time to come. And uh, this is not a President Trump phenomenon. Uh, if, he, if he wins, I think, in, uh, in 2020, you will see China um, continuing to be a part of the conversation. If he loses, China will continue to be a part of the conversation. Uh, and it is an area where you see um, a bipartisan uh, consensus views that this is, uh, this is an economic challenge that needs to be taken seriously. So um, you know, I wouldn't think of uh, the trade war and the, the rhetoric around China as um, a very specific thing that uh, is going to go away if the political winds shift. I don't think it is. Um, so obviously, that's something uh, to keep an eye on. The, uh, the US and the EU are working to, uh, to find uh, a deal to be done. Uh, and um, one of the interesting dynamics here is uh, the carbon tax and discussions around the environment. Now, there's, um, you know, there's, a, there's a cynical view of discussions around a carbon tax that it's, it's meant to protect uh, certain industries. I think there's a broader view of this, that this is really around uh, uh, you know, serious conversations about how to confront uh, an existential threat, and that's permeating everything, including trade discussions. But, um, but I think no matter how you cut it, this issue is going to be at the center of uh, the discussions that the US and the EU are having. Whether a deal gets done, we'll see. You know, Chris and I joke, he's the pessimist, I'm the optimist. Uh, I'm an optimist. I think um, you know, there was a question early in the, in the Trump administration as to whether or not they could get to yes when, uh, when it comes to trade discussions. And I think the answer to that um, uh, has been yes. They can get to a yes. Now, that interestingly enough, I think, uh, may reduce some of the administration's leverage in future discussions. But, uh, but it does seem that they can get to yes and deals can get done. We'll see if that is the case. Uh, in, um, with the EU and the US. If it doesn't happen, if we do see uh, problems emerging, um, what you see up here are industries that could potentially be hit. At the bottom, you see uh, some, some consumer-facing industries. You know, it's hard to imagine that food and beverage, uh, you know, pharma uh, is where you see the action. Just politically, uh, it's much easier to target uh, intermediate goods as opposed to consumer goods. So machinery is a place where you're likely to see some action if, if things start to get ugly there. Generally speaking, though, I, I, uh, I think um, deals are likely to get done. India, uh, you know, if you look at this chart uh, and you look at the lines going down, um, that's China. That's, that's China's trade with the US. Uh, and it's clearly taken a hit in the current political environment. Vietnam, that's the bars going up. Vietnam has been a, a clear winner. India is, is an economy that, um, kind of all else being equal, you might expect to be a winner uh, from the US-China uh, trade dispute. So far, that's not the case. I think um, there's appetite, certainly, uh, on, on India's side to get a deal done. Um, I, you know, I think the US administration has proven that they can get to a yes, but they've also proven that um, there's, there's unpredictability at work. So uh, the U.S. Trade Representative uh, Lighteiser just canceled a trip to India. What does that mean? People are trying to figure it out. Nobody knows. But, um, but my money is, is on deals getting done. So that's 2020. Looking further ahead, uh, you know, as, as I was thinking about um, this discussion, I, I was reminded of uh, an observation by uh, Jeff Bezos. 
He was asked, uh, I believe in an interview, about what changes he expected over the next 10 years. And he took it as an opportunity to, to reveal how he thinks about business strategy. And he, he talked about how people often question what's going to change over the next you know, 10 years, 20 years. But they don't often uh, think hard about the question, what's going to remain the same over the next 10 to 20 years? Uh, when you do, um, and if you can put your finger on those things that are going to stay the same, you can build a strategy around those things. Right? You can build a durable strategy. So as he says, right, people are always going to want lower prices. Nobody's ever going to say, wow, I, you know, I love Amazon. I just wish they'd charge me a little more. All right? So the fact that people want low prices is something you can build a strategy around. So as I think ahead uh, to um, what the future holds, I think it's important to think about change, but I also think it's important to think about what's going to stay the same. So a couple of, of observations along these lines. So the first is that the geography of supply chains, it's going to be a dynamic story. So this was true before the current political environment. I mentioned that executives asked us about how to diversify beyond China. This has been a running conversation. You've seen some companies that have made progress. Up here, you'll see uh, Giant, the bicycle company, has made a lot of progress in reducing the percentage of their imports that are coming from China. You look at other companies and you see uh, much less progress being made. But this is you know, something that has been playing out just due to economics because of the rising wages in China. Then you add the political context, uh, and of course, that's accelerated change. I think as you look ahead, uh, the economic context is always going to be dynamic. Right? Wage rates change, currencies change. That drives uh, dynamism in terms of the geography of supply chains. Politics. You know, at one point, there was the you know, speculation that we reached the end of history. Right? We've, you know, it's very clear which economic model, which political model is going to carry the day. You know, we can all just live our lives knowing exactly what's going to happen. But as one of my mentors says, history keeps happening. The political context keeps changing. Now, add one more factor, technology. Technology is changing rapidly. You put these three things together, economics, politics, technology, you see change in each of these realms. Global trade is going to continue to be very dynamic as a result of that. So things like betting that the current geographic landscape is going to be uh, the geographic landscape of the future, that's a bad bet. Betting that one country is going to be the winner, that's a bad bet. Uh, the, the dynamism of global trade, I think, is one of the things that is, um, we can count on in the decade ahead. Now, it's a little cliche, right? Change is the one thing that isn't going to change. Uh, but I think in global trade, it's true. Second uh, is the, um, you know, the rise of environmental concerns and, and the, the extent to which these are going to be front and center in trade conversations. Now, I do think one of the uh, misconceptions about trade uh, for those who don't live and breathe trade is that it's always about business and about economics. But of course, the reality, which I, I know all of you know, is that trade is always about more than just business uh, and economics. If you go back to the Cold War, right, global trade, trade was, trade policy was uh, interwoven with national security. Trade was a way of binding the various parts of the Soviet Union together. It was uh, a way of um, binding NATO allies, allies together. Uh, it was never uh, separate from politics. So, uh, you know, that was then. Now, uh, yes, of course, you know, business interests uh, are front and center when you're talking about trade, but uh, it's not, I think, at all surprising that you have non-political issues rising up uh, to the center of trade. And I think the one that's here to stay uh, is uh, the environment and climate. Uh, so uh, if you look here, what you see is kind of the, the narrow uh, view of this. If you look at industries that could pay a price, if there's a carbon tax, you see um, steel, aluminum, uh, you know, that's... Uh, those are industries that are likely to be hit. Frankly, they haven't done very well recently anyways. 
you know, that's the narrow view. I think the broader view is that the environment and, and climate is going to be center stage in uh, trade conversations going forward. And then lastly, uh, technology. So uh, this is a, a chart that I, I squinted at for a long time uh, to try and see if I could make sense of it. Uh, and what it is, it's, it's actually very cool if you get into it. Uh, it um, it's shows clusters of uh, supply chain activities. So what you see here is H&M, big retailer, uh, their suppliers, uh, which are in orange, and then the suppliers of those suppliers in purple. You know, this is a really cool data visualization. Uh, and um, you know, what can you do with it? Well, you know, an example which Chris uh, told me about is you can look for supply chain triangles where you can believe as a company that you have a well-diversified supply chain because you're buying the same product from a bunch of different suppliers. But then if you go one level deeper, you see that all of those suppliers are buying raw materials from the same supplier. And so your risk is actually much more concentrated than you might have thought. Visualization gets you to these insights. Uh, in, in my career, I've been a little bit of a hater on vi data visualization. It feels a little fluffy uh, to me. You can get insights by getting you know, into the, the raw data. Uh, but you know, the truth is that uh, visualization, I think, is an important tool in the toolbox of getting value from data. Uh, and you know, at the end of the day, I think that's the business, certainly, that Pangeva is in that S&P Global Market Intelligence is in, and, and ultimately S&P Global as a whole, helping us get value from data. It is one of the things that I think we can bank on in the decade ahead. Uh, there's going to be more and more data, more and more things you can do with data. But let's be honest, it's hard to get value from data. Uh, and our job as a company is to try and make it a bit easier. So uh, with that, I want to hand it over to uh, somebody who uh, is enormously talented at helping make sense of data, uh, our chief economist, Paul Grunwald. OK, thanks, uh, Josh. And good morning, everyone. Happy Valentine's Day. I'd like to ask the uh, first panel to come up uh, to the stage, please. Josh said, um, this is all about the intersection of economics, uh, trade, and politics. And we have an economist, a trade expert, and a politician on the first panel. So we, uh, we've got you uh, covered. So let me ask uh, uh, Satcham, Representative Horsford, and, uh, and Chris to come up. And uh, I will take my seat. Uh, gentlemen, you can just take any seat you want. We don't have assigned seating. And uh, maybe Eric can come up here. While we're getting seated, we can ask the first uh, question and try out your app. So I'll kick it over to Eric, and then I'll introduce the panel. Good. Great. So the first question we're, we're talking about today uh, is what are the prospects for US-China relations in 2020? <clears throat> so if you pull out your phones um, and, and go to that website, you should be able to uh, answer the question. I think you have 30 seconds, so you have to make up your mind quickly. <laughs> and this is also where I make my joke that this is the wrong way to hold a survey because you're not supposed to see what other people are answering <laughs> because it's conditioning your response. So this is more fun rather than uh, science. but. Uh, let me give it 10 more seconds, although I think the, uh, the outcome looks pretty, uh, pretty decisive here. A lot more decisive than our recent Democratic uh, caucuses and primaries. <laughs> so we'll keep the political jokes to a minimum here. Um, right, so it looks like we've got uh, a, a very strong uh, um, uh, result, even a, a clear majority for chi China fails to meet its purchasing commitments, but otherwise phase one deal holds a uh, reasonable second for f phase one holds, and there's no two, and then everything else is kind of marginal. So let me introduce uh, the panel here. Uh, I'll go from, uh, from near to far. You've already met uh, Chris Rogers. He's a Pangeva supply chain analyst, and he pinged me for the right term. He's part of S&P Global's quantum mental research group. So quantum mental is not a word, but I think we know what it means. So quantum 
quantum and fundamental, so that's great. Uh, in the middle there is uh, Steve Horsford. He is the Democratic congressman from the great state of Nevada, 4th District. Uh, welcome, Congressman. Great to have you here. And uh, last but not least, to the far left is my colleague, Sachin Pandey from the S&P Global uh, economics team. He's the senior U.S. and Canadian economist, so welcome uh, all three of you. The way I'm going to structure this panel is we're going to hit uh, a small number of issues. We'll start with U.S.-China uh, post phase one, then we'll do a little bit about politics, uh, then I'll ask you another question and we'll pivot a bit to uh, U.S.-Europe and then uh, maybe wrap it up with some big thoughts about globalization, and then we'll do some Q&A. Maybe, Chris, we can kick it off with you. Could you just give us a quick summary of uh, US-China phase one and kind of your reading from your spot of what we should be looking for in terms of the implementation of the deal? Yeah, sure thing. Thank you, Paul. Thank you again, everybody, for uh, well, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for uh, coming again today. So I think... Um, the, the phase one trade deal um, in many regards is, um, firstly, it's a deal that was a long time coming, um, but it's also a deal that um, is very similar to an initial agreement that was reached all the way back in um, May of 2018. So there's been a lot of backward and forward agreements and disagreements, formulations and deformulations. I make a lot of words up. Quantumental wasn't the only one. Um, you know what you mean, though. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, to all intents and purposes, where we've ended up with this phase one deal is somewhere that we could have been quite a long time ago. And I think as a consequence of which, it, it does feel very much like a, um, a deal where both sides just wanted to get something done, to show some sort of progress. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, when we disinter what's in that, um, what's in that deal, um, effectively the, the centerpiece of it is a, a significant commitment from China to buy American goods and services or to facilitate the purchase of um, American goods and services, in return for which, you know, no more tariff pressure and a, a little bit of a wind back of, of existing tariffs. Now, looking at that kind of second bit first, it's quite important to bear in mind that, you know, to, to our mind, what you haven't seen is the end of the trade war. It's just yet another round, and we, we wrote a piece of research that ended up with um, over 70 events that have happened over the past couple of years that have been a, a worsening and then a pause, a worsening and a pause. And this is just a big version, um, a big version of a pause. Um, I think it's important to, to bear in mind, therefore, that these commitments have to be delivered on. Now, let's talk a little bit about what those commitments are from China. Um, the general um, kind of view is, well, China's going to buy some soybeans and everything's great and, and, and we move along. But that's only a tiny piece of it. So China's committed to buying $200 billion dollars of US goods in 2020 and 2021 above the level of 2017. Um, so you know, we're, we're talking you know, um, a three quarters plus expansion. Within that, within that 200 billion, soybeans is only about you know, 15 to 20 billion. The biggest components, as we saw in, in Josh's chart, um, which I put together, so <laughs> to, <laughs> to recap my own numbers, um, the biggest components of that are manufactured goods and services. Um, and, and that's tough, right? Because soybeans and oil and gas, you can direct a state-owned company to go buy them. You know, that's one of the, the, the positive features of having a state-owned economy, um, a state-run um, uh, enterprise, excuse me. Um, all those other areas, the manufactured goods, and that's everything from cars to pharmaceuticals, jet planes, and so on. Some of these are bought by state-owned enterprises, others aren't. As a consequence, there's by no means a guarantee that that's going to get done. Services is very complicated, right? It's going to include financial services. That's great for us as a company. It's great for a lot of our customers um, in the commercial banking field, in the insurance field, in the credit card field. Um, MasterCard is just the latest company to really ramp up their business in China. But again, a 45% increase in services growth, uh, in, in, in services sales in two years, considering that annual growth was 5 to 10% beforehand, is, is pretty darn steep. So, you know, it's steep is where it's at. Um, you know, it's difficult to see those commitments being delivered upon, particularly and against the background of effectively maybe, um, and Sachin can probably talk about, um, or you could talk about the ratings view on this, but against the background of a, a significant fisc uh, economic drag from coronavirus, COVID-19 as we're calling it now. So pause in the trade war, not the end of the trade war, commitments that have been made that are going to be difficult to deliver. 
that's where we kind of see phase Directionally, we get there, but in the actual quantum, it's going to be difficult to yeah, absolutely. get those headlines. Absolutely. Great. Maybe we'll get a political angle on this. Uh, Congressman, maybe we could hear from you on, well, the big question, how much do people actually care about this? But maybe focusing both on, on your district in Nevada and also maybe your colleagues in, in Washington, how all this is playing out. Well, good morning, and it's great to be here. I want to thank uh, Panjiva and John and uh, Chris and uh, Kellen and everyone who uh, invited me to participate. It's great to be on this panel. Um, I'm from Nevada, and uh, outside of Las Vegas, my district covers 52,000 square miles. Um, and so I have both rural and urban areas. And in our state, we export uh, just over $2.3 billion. Um, and so this is very important, uh, our, our overall trade policy and trade uh, strategy is very important uh, to our economic growth. Um, I currently serve on the Ways and Means Committee, uh, so we deal with trade, um, tariff, taxation, as well as health care policy. Um, and when we talk to constituents back home, what they care about are their jobs and economic growth. That's how they decipher what this really means to them. Um, and so what I always have to articulate is any trade agreements that we're entering into, any negotiations that we're having uh, with other countries, how, how does it help us as, as a state and as the United States continue to remain competitive and to grow, particularly in key sectors? Uh, <clears throat> specifically, though, on the China deal, and I, I don't fully call it a trade deal because I don't think it has congressional oversight and accountability as other trade deals have. Um, but it lacks some of the basic fundamentals that we expect of any trade agreement, and that includes worker protections, uh, environmental protections, and enforceability. And I think that's going to be one of the biggest impediments to the agreement that uh, the Trump administration has reached with China is how do you enforce any of this? Uh, in the short and the long term. China ha has had um, uh, a strategy by which they um, engage and disengage, uh, and so they haven't been consistent partners. Uh, and quite honestly, uh, the president has undermined some of his own um, trade representatives in the negotiations with China. And so that makes uh, all of this a very precarious situation. Uh, but we want to see. Uh, this relationship grow. We understand how important China is, to John's uh, point uh, in, the, in the earlier presentation. Uh, we cannot dismiss uh, their influence from a consumer standpoint here in the United States or what it means to job creation and our overall economic growth in the United States. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much. And um, we'll go, go now to Satyam, who has the uh, uh, unenviable task of trying to uh, funnel all this into a coherent U.S. economic view. So, Sacha, maybe share with us <laughs> yeah. how you uh, and your colleagues in the U.S. team tried to, you know, sort this all out and measure the economic impact on the U.S. as a whole. Sure. First of all, you know, thanks for having me. I'm honored to be on the same panel as you, Congressman, and Chris. I'm a supply chain expert. Me too, right? Uh, yeah, and, yeah, I'm as boss as boss. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. But in terms of the U.S. macro by itself, you know, we have to keep in mind that U.S. is very domestically driven economy. 85% of the U.S. Uh, you know, production activity. These are all domestic. We're very, uh, you know, compared to the rest of the world. Uh, it, you know, people use the word we are a closed economy in a sense. Uh, even though the trade channel has been increasing. Uh, so when the phase one uh, you know, agreement happened, we thought maybe perhaps it will add about 10 to 20 basis points to the annual average growth rate in the US. So we had it at 1.7% pre-phase one trade deal for 2020. Now we think it's going to be 1.9%. Now some of the things, some of the channels that we look at is one is the direct channel, which is our exports will be increasing. And the other one is the indirect channel where the business confidence and the financial market sentiments have turned positive. When you look at just the direct channel, it, I go back to the feasibility aspect of the phase one trade deal. Uh, 
you know, Chris pointed out that it's a huge jump from the 2017 levels. As a macroeconomist, when we go back, look at the 2017 trend back then, what the exports to China was doing, when you just do a simple trend, linear trend, and then see the deviation from that itself, it's a massive jump. Then I ask myself the question, do we really have the capacity to deliver? It's not just the Chinese side uh, you know, wanting to take it in, but us also having the capacity to deliver. And when you look at the industrial capacity utilization rates in the US, yes, there is some room for improvement in the US. We are, you know, most of the industries are running under 80% of capacity, which, is, which means we have some room for improvement. But the amount of goods that uh, we are thinking of delivering is too a lot more than just your capacity that we have. So there has to be a lot more investments going in, which take about one or two years just to get, you know, set up all of that. And more importantly, I think globally, we'll have some trade shifting going on. So some of the soybeans that maybe Brazil was delivering to uh, China is probably going to be delivered by the US. Uh, and, uh, you know, there will be trade shifting, there will be some losers globally. But at the end of the day, for the US by itself, we're thinking you know, 10, 20 basis points added to growth. Okay, thanks very much. Let's shift now to politics. We're obviously in an election year. Uh, we've got one caucus and one primary under our belt. Uh, Nevada is next, so it's great to have the congressman here. So I wanted to tee uh, you up, sir, on maybe you know, the, the pantheon of issues that our politicians are looking at. How would you place trade in there? And then maybe follow up on a specific point you mentioned earlier about congressional oversight and trade deals. Maybe you could talk us through a little bit of your thinking on that issue as well. Thank you. Well, yes, tomorrow, uh, actually, voters uh, begin to go to the polls. Uh, we have what's called an early caucus. Uh, so tomorrow, uh, people will start to early caucus for the next four days, and then our actual caucus is next Saturday, uh, February 22nd. Uh, don't worry, our results will come in uh, the same <laughs> night. <laughs> We're doing a paper ballot, <laughs> old-fashioned. Um, when we talk about trade, again, to the average voter in my district, they don't view it as the, the term trade. They view it as what does this mean to my job, to my wage growth, and to our overall competitiveness. And what I always try to talk about with trade is it's not just about being um, competitive from a standpoint of trade or our, our tax rate, but also uh, our competitiveness from the standpoint of the American workforce and the skills and the investment that we're making uh, in American workers in order to compete in a 21st century global economy. Um, I think if you see what came out of the USMCA trade deal, uh, where it started uh, with Ambassador Lighthizer, and I give him uh, full uh, credit for the work that he did to guide that process along the way, uh, but the trade agreement that was presented to Congress is not the trade agreement that we ultimately voted on. We made uh, major uh, improvements to that agreement uh, to include uh, major uh, improvements in environmental uh, protections and enforceability, uh, worker protections and enforceability. Um, and that will become, in my view, the new standard for future trade deals uh, in the future. Um, and so I think that reflects the priorities that uh, Democrats in Congress had uh, to work towards a trade agreement, but to do so in such a way that reflects our values and priorities, uh, and most importantly, the ability to enforce um, any trade agreements. There were major standards put on Mexico, for example, uh, and we expected them to make some of those improvements before we ultimately allowed that bill to come to a vote. Um, and so that's kind of the direction that we're going to expect things to go in the future. When we talk about uh, congressional oversight and accountability, um, for among my colleagues, I'm, I'm a returning member, uh, so I'm technically a red shirt freshman. Uh, I served for two years back in 2012. I lost in 14 uh, by less than 3,000 votes, and I came back in 2018 as part of the new Democratic majority. And so a lot of my colleagues and I, particularly the newer members, we believe that Congress needs to reassert our role 
um, in oversight and in trade, in foreign policy, um, and in, in making sure that we hold the executive branch accountable uh, and that we're not going to just um, uh, cede some of our congressional authority to the executive branch. Uh, and that is where trade is, is a perfect example and, and why USMCA, in my view, uh, is an example of why we did work with the administration, but we did so in a way that made sure that there was congressional review of the agreement and where we did not agree, we made improvements and those were codified uh, into law and will be in the implementation bill that follows. Yeah, thanks very much. Let me uh, go back to uh, Satyam. This is kind of a political economy question. Josh, at the beginning, was talking about, I guess you didn't mention Francis Fukuyama, but it was the end of history and the, the neoliberal argument won, and we were talking about the Washington consensus. But obviously, um, those of us who supported that got parts of that wrong, right, Incl including the economists and, and free trade. So, you know, as economists sitting in the U.S. desk and watching all this happen, and you're a bit younger than I am, so maybe your graduate school memory is fresher, but <laughs> what do you think is a, this is the mea culpa or nostra culpa part of the uh, presentation, what, what did we kind of miss when we were thinking about the benefits of trade and we're seeing this pushback now and, you know, maybe your thoughts on that. Sure. Um, so all these, uh, you know, workhorse models in your mainstream economics, I think they got the price factor correct, where, you know, when you think about trade, there are two main channels that hits the distribution of households, you know, from the wealthy to the lowest income. There's a price channel and there's a labor market channel. I think the price channel, it worked out as the models had predicted. We do get a lot uh, lower prices coming in, uh, you know, and the share of uh, the goods in a lower income household, the basket, is much higher in the traded goods and services. So that, I think, has been a net positive overall, even for the bottom 50 percentile. The more, I think, underappreciated part is the labor market side, where the duration of displacement, the models, they tend to make it a little more flexible than what really has been in experience, and I think the duration of displacement has been something that uh, has not worked out, and, and that has led to a, a lot of negative sentiments towards the trade. So that's one thing, the duration of displacement. And number two, when you lose a job uh, from empirical research, it's shown that those who lost their jobs and, it, and they took up the next job, especially if they had to change industry or occupation, they saw that their annual income fell at least by half. Mm. So if you were making, let's say, $50,000, it went down to 25000 because you lost your industry-specific skills, you lost your uh, occupation-specific skills, and that has been a big uh, issue. And so both displacement and uh, your skill-specific biases have shown up in these uh, you know, this popular rising against the trade. And, you know, there's a, a lot to do with the technological automation and, and all of them is happening at the same time. We shouldn't forget that. But these, all, all of these together has led us to kind of sort of be a little bit more cautious. Maybe we should add some more job training programs, more social safety net around these. Uh, you know, that would be a good thing. But, yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll just, yield. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this 30 second digression, when I was in graduate school before Satyam was up the road here at Columbia, I won't name the professor, but this issue came up in one of the lectures about the, you know, the benefits of trade through lower prices to consumers. And then you know, the labor market and redistributive part of it came up. And he basically said, well, that's for the politicians to work out. Then we went on to the next model, right? So it really was never discussed in the, in the training that a lot of the mainstream economists get. And you know, there's a uh, big backlash against, I think, that omission. Maybe, Chris, wrap up with you on this uh, question. Um, sure. You're a data-driven business, as Josh said. We're trying to talk about politics here. How do you kind of work in all that stuff? I mean, you've got a cool uh, daily report. We've got a lot of company news and, and industry news and, and market news. So how does that figure into your day-to-day -day job? Might be helpful for the folks in the audience. Yeah, sure. So I think, um, I mean, we always talk about our research as being kind of set on, on three legs. One is trade policy. Uh, one is logistics industry and uh, the other is industrial supply chains. And I kind of put that partly in place because Josh always loves things to be in threes. Um, but it's an important point that um, we have to consider all these things together. 
So, yeah, I'm kind of very humbled for you, from uh, the point you made, Congressman, to we have to remember this is about people's jobs. And, and as a consequence, you know, how does that feed through? It's about their demand. It's about what companies are going to do. They need certainty. So I think when we're looking at trade policy and, and when we run the numbers on this, it's always about where are the direct impacts going to be and how do companies um, deal with that. Um, we saw a chart earlier showing how um, a number of companies, um, you know, ranging from uh, clothing manufacturers like Superdry through to bicycle manufacturers like Giant through to capital goods companies like, like Foster Electric, where they've shifted their supply chains around. And we can measure that very directly. What it's more difficult to measure is um, what are kind of management's attitudes towards um, where they have enough certainty to make those changes on an ongoing basis and, and, and kind of how they navigate that. Um, one of the tools we've uh, been putting together, and colleagues from the rest of the Quantum Mental Research Group are, are here, is measuring sentiment in what management teams are saying about the impact of politics upon them. We call it TDA, text data analytics. But you know, it's a serious point that we can run all of these kind of hard supply chain numbers that we want, but ultimately it's the decisions that companies are making, that investors are making, that ultimately has a real impact on, on um, you know, the, the voters, people who, who are employed and, and, and what it all means to them. In the meantime, we've got plenty of data to judge. You know, is this trade deal going to work or not? It's not a trade deal, I apologize. This trade agreement, <laughs> um, this trade completed, semi-completed trade We're making trade progress already. But. Yeah, there you go. Um, whether it's going to work or not, but we're still gonna have to ask whether it's working or not working, um, you know, have businesses got enough certainty to make the hard decisions, to make the investments? Um, over the longer term, and okay. I don't necessarily feel like we are there yet, um, but the data will tell us what it will tell us. Excellent. Okay, well, uh, that knocks off the first two bits, so maybe we can go to your um, phones again and ask uh, the second question, which is about uh, US-EU, and uh, that again will get the, uh, maybe get the, uh, the juices flowing for the, the next uh, section here uh, on the panel, so please, uh, as quickly as possible, put your <laughs> answers into that one. I have to stall for 30 seconds here, so I realize no one's wished you a happy Valentine's Day yet, so I wanted to say happy Valentine's Day to everyone. We, we do often write about uh, the, the supply chain of Valentine's Day and um, the uh, Company, uh, Where do those little to... kissy, sugary things come from? You know, those uh, that says, you know... They're I'm made all over. They haven't got room for <laughs> made in China on the back, but right. we, we just <laughs> those down. Um, actually, most Valentine's imports are done at the same time as the Halloween imports, so oh, really? it's uh, similar companies producing them. But that's a, a product area that's very dependent on China and didn't have tariffs applied. I think uh, tariffs on toys and tar tariffs on Valentine's goods are not to uh, vote winners. Okay. All right, so I think your 30 seconds are quickly coming to a close. You guys like the middle option in all these questions. So again, almost a clear majority for no deal is reached, uh, but no new tariffs are applied either. I can read between the lines and see some politics there uh, as well. Uh, carbon border tax looks like it's coming in second. We'll make sure we touch upon that on the next section. Uh, Chris, let's uh, start with you again. I mean, this is a trade deal. Why don't you set the stage for ESEU? What are you watching? What data? What yeah. politics? What technology? Sure. And then tee up the rest of the, yeah, the panel. Yeah, sure. sure, sure. Yeah, so I think US-EU relations are, you know, kind of, it's at the heart of what we put into our um, outlook for this year that um, they're very much on a knife edge at the moment. On the one hand, um, there's very much a desire on both sides to do a deal of some sort but a fundamental disagreement as to what sort of deal it's actually going to be. And a lot of that is born out of the way that um, the European Commission um, under van der Leyden and the US government under President Trump see how trade relations should work. The EU is all about the fully baked, complete, everything's covered trade deal. It covers services, it covers goods, it covers standards. Um, and that's what the EU is looking for. And those things take a long time to do. You know, the trade deal with Canada took, I, 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 I think I got back to kind of the mid-2000s, at least when these talks started. And, you know, the ratification process alone took over a year. So, you know, those deals take a long time to do. And, and yet, you know, we're very much dealing with um, an administration in the US that values um, getting something done quickly. And I don't think that's wrong, by the way. You know, it's very easy for these trade deals to disappear off into years' worth of negotiations and there be no tangible outcome. But I think you know, the challenge on the EU side is 
very much that whilst it's a different commission to when it was um, a few years ago, they'll say, well, we had a perfectly good trade deal. You know, we, we had TTIP, um, which you know, was knocking around um, just before the, um, the, the Trump, administration, Trump administration came in. That effectively Senate was, uh, that was blocked in the Senate by um, the Republicans. And uh, it was a perfectly good comprehensive trade deal. And now we've got to go all the way back to the beginning. Now, one of the things that the European Commission has been very clear about within these trade deals is that there has to be an environmental component to it. And that environmental component also um, has to be twinned with the new European Green Deal. Um, I don't know if that's meant to sound like a new deal, um, but certainly the Green Deal in involves trying to level the playing field um, with regards to um, you know, including environmental issues, specifically, obviously, around greenhouse gases. Um, the carbon border tax, in other words, will say, okay, if you're importing to the EU from outside but you don't have carbon pricing in your country, we're going to apply a tariff or a tax that's equivalent to you having paid it. Is that good for the environment? Who knows? Does it feel like protectionism? Yes, it does. And so is the reaction from the US going to be, well, hang on a minute, you're telling us you don't want new tariffs and yet this looks, you know, it's the old duck thing, right? Is it quacking like a duck? Well, it, so, you know, we're going to consider it as a tariff. And that could be enough to kill um, negotiations. If you want a worked example of how quickly things can change, the French government applied a digital services tax, um, which is a broader issue we can get into later, but they applied that in July of last year, and the um, US government came back with tariffs almost straight away. Now, ultimately, everyone stepped back from the brink on that, but that's a very tangible area where um, the, the US government said, okay, we're facing, uh, American companies are facing $500 million of extra costs, here's some tariffs straight back at you in the same value. And, and that was an immediate deterioration. It's very easy, um, well, obviously it's not easy to put numbers around it. We do a very complicated job here at Pangeva in calculating trade numbers. Um, they're not that easy, but the numbers can be put around it and they can be put around it quickly. So you know, I worry that on the one hand, there's a willingness to do a deal, but a disagreement on what that deal looks like. And on the other hand, we've got plenty of triggers that could make it all go wrong very quickly. Yeah, Congressman, let me go to you next. Uh, Chris was talking about the, the Green New Deal, and we know that at least one wing of the uh, Democratic Party, the Progressive Party, is pushing uh, on that as well. Europe seems to be in the lead here. Even the Germans are moving now on environmental fiscal spending and finally get them going on that front. But what's, what's the outlook, you think, for uh, the U.S., and how is that going to bubble through the, the, the Democratic Party, and what does Congress think about all these environmental issues, and then how does that map into trade? Well, climate is a major priority. Uh, yes, there are different approaches uh, from the Green New Deal to, uh, you know, investing in uh, clean energy. Uh, the Ways and Means Committee is right now working on a package of uh, tax incentives for renewable energy. Again, I come from a state that has an abundance of uh, solar, wind, and geothermal. Uh, we have a high renewable portfolio standard uh, and are continuing to increase it. So climate will, I agree, absolutely be uh, a part of any future agreements. I think the United States in this administration, though, has to um, address our backing off of the Paris Climate Agreement, because until we come to terms with our position there, it's real hard for us to impose uh, those standards on other countries, particularly European countries. I actually had the honor of going uh, to uh, the UK and to Ireland with Speaker Pelosi and Chairman Neal uh, April of last year uh, before all the Brexit and uh, all the uh, fallout over that. But we were very clear during that trip, and, and the Speaker was specifically, um, that there will be no bilateral agreement between uh, uh, the UK and the United States without uh, commitments to the Good Friday Accord uh, and other uh, general commitments. So while climate is a primary focus, there are a number of other issues that would have to be part of any uh, bilateral agreement uh, with the UK. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done. I think that, again, I'm, I'm trying not to be partisan here, but this administration's contempt of certain European countries uh, is already hurting our ability to maintain uh, those open uh, dialogues and conversations. And this is why we need congressional leadership 
to show that uh, there is a congressional voice on these issues that are not always aligned with the executive branch. Okay, thanks very much. And then maybe, Satcham, to you, you are uh, covering the U.S. and Canada. You're sitting amongst a whole bunch of credit analysts from different sectors. And maybe you could think of, t talk us through a bit about maybe one level down from the macro. We're talking about U.S. and Europe, and there's sectoral implications for a lot of the stuff we're, we're discussing today. Maybe kind of filter us into that world and how you look at it. Right. Um, in terms of EU, so first of all, in a broader macro sense, EU as a bloc, uh, the, you know, they are the top uh, destination for our exports from the US. So it does matter more than what we saw with China. It is, it's not the same thing. This is at a whole different level scale. And especially you know, when it comes to the labor market, again, I go back to labor market, uh, you know, about a th a 3 million or so jobs are relying on this particular export market that goes to EU. So from you know, uh, empirical estimates that I've seen out there. So this is a big deal. So whenever there's a disruption in this particular channel, uh, it's going to have uh, lots of heads sort of looking around like how much is it going to affect. And we think, at least from our own corporate side, the auto sector is uh, facing a big, uh, you know, just a headwind just from the tariffs that have already been put in place in the steel and uh, you know aluminium plus the, the threatened tariffs coming in in the name of national security um, and then we have other you know the the aerospace would be another one Boeing versus Airbus um, so all of these are, they tend to be the big ticket item in the US that has a spillover effect in the macro economy much larger than any other industry right any other product so Boeing, you know, when Boeing has an issue with 737 MAX, it's going to show up in your GDP accounts. The same thing with any car GM factor. So when these big ticket items get affected by trade disruption, it is going to have an effect in our macroeconomic growth forecasts as well. Great, thanks very much. And let's go to the final uh, segment here for the panel. I wanted to step back and maybe think a bit more broadly about just globalization generally, right? Again, we were, we were in a world about 25 years ago that was uh, based on rules, based on markets, based on what we would call the Washington consensus. Uh, we never used the word deal for anything, and now everything seems to be a deal. So maybe, Congressman, I can start with you. How do you and your colleagues, both on maybe the Democratic side and on the other side of the aisle, how do you think about these global institutions? I mean, looking from the U point of U.S. interests, we've got the w not just the WTO, but the IMF and the World Bank. Are those still useful, or is it just the big guys are going to sit down and do deals? And how do, how do, you, how do you guys think about that? We think about it a lot, um, and the WTO, actually, Ron Kind, one of our colleagues on the Ways and Means Committee, just, again, had a bipartisan CODEL uh, to discuss uh, the the changes in, and reforms at the WTO, and again, to make sure that the administration is not backing off of our commitments uh, through the WTO, and, and that's one of the biggest issues. Uh, I'm, IMF is largely at, uh, handled through the Financial Services Committee. I previously served on that committee, um, but we view these institutions as important institutions uh, to being able to, again, set and maintain those standards. Uh, uh, globally and for us to be able to work internationally with our partners. Uh, so we, again, we believe Congress needs to exert our uh, constitutional authority um, in order to remind our international partners that these are institutions that we help build. We believe in them. We want them uh, to be supported. Um, and while the president and the administration may have criticisms about how they're run or who's supporting them or who's involved, uh, there are other perspectives who, who coming from Congress, uh, where we believe these, these are important institutions to our global health uh, and ability to compete. Okay, maybe, uh, Chris, we can spin that over to you. Um, we do seem to be in this world where, you know, size matters. And uh, so my question to you is, you know, what's a, what's a respectable mid-sized country supposed to do these days, right? We talked about <laughs> UK's one. Yeah. At one point, I was the IMF rep to Korea. That's another one that seems to be caught between giants. So what should a, what should a respectable mid-sized country do with all this stuff? And how should they approach, you know, trade policy, et cetera? 
Yeah, I think the, um, I, you're right. I mean, I, I always say to our, our customers, when we get to the topic of Brexit, I don't like to talk about it because it makes me sad. Okay. <laughs> um, but, but with all of that said, you've asked a broader question, so I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> I think the, um, it, it, it is very difficult. I think the first thing that um, any country needs to do, and I, I think um, certainly in my, in my home country, um, for those Americans here, I'm British, not Australian, just to, to, to clarify the accent. <laughs> I think we do, yeah. Yeah, look, anyway. No, so look, the, the, the point here is countries need to understand what they want first and foremost. So in the chorus renegotiation between the US and South Korea, South Korea was very clear about which industries they wanted to protect where they saw opening opportunities and what they could offer to the United States in order to you know, kind of you know, get that deal done. I think a central challenge that's faced in the United Kingdom at the moment is the United Kingdom doesn't really know what it wants. The, the, um, the, the, uh, the Johnson administration um, has left very little time for consultation with business. And you know, most businesses, um, you know, and certainly the ones that we speak to, the ones that we analyze, will say, we don't care what the rules are, we just need them to be certain, and we need you to understand where we're coming from. And, and, and that, lack of, um, that lack of connectivity between investment and business decision makers and politicians is where a, a mid-sized company can really you know, run into to problems. I think the other thing um, some of these mid-sized countries can do is get together in their own deals. Um, you know, we've certainly seen, um, you know, I think RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership in Asia, is made up of some big countries. It's got China in there, it's got Japan in there, it's got South Korea in there. Um, but the ASEAN states, Australia, New Zealand are being involved as well because they recognize that it's better to be a part of something to, than to be a part of nothing. Um, and I think that's the other route. I wouldn't be surprised, for example, to see um, the UK join the, the USMCA. Um, I'm not sure whether that ends up being the UUSMCA <laughs> we'll or the GVUSMCA. <laughs> okay. But anyway, the point is joining another route for, um, for, for mid-sized countries to go down is to join these other deals and accept it's not going to be a perfect deal, but let's not let the enemy, uh, the perfect be the enemy of the good. I think you know, there's, there's deals to be done and you know, I, as Josh mentioned earlier, I tend to be the pessimist and, and see all these things that can go wrong, but there are lots of deals to be done that can generate I think, um, you know, real value for, um, for people and, and for business. Okay. And then finally, Sacham, uh, from you, economist view of all this globalization, how do you make sense of this? Does it move the U.S. needle? Anything you'd like to, uh, to add? Well, you know, just going back to the WTO part and globalization in general, the way we see it is there are, you know, countries, the midsize and the small countries, you know, which are the price takers mm. or the regulation takers. And there are the price setters, like the big blocks, let's say EU, US, mm. China now. Um, and WTO is a rules. Uh, it's, the whole platform is to make sure that there's a good rule-based playing field in the trade. And for the medium-sized and the small countries, that's a good thing. They will flourish in that kind of an, an environment. Now, there has to be a buy-in from the big price setters. If there is no buy-in from the big price setters, and right now, US and China having their own bilateral, and then just hearing from your presentation about the carbon taxes, now, if EU is also getting into putting more tariffs, that goes against the WTO's principles where they want lower tariffs. They want to make it more open. So we are at a point where, um, well, I don't, you know, we don't have enough evidence yet, but we have to see where exactly this is headed. WTO's ex sustainability of that kind of a framework is in question, for sure. Okay, uh, great, thanks very much. Okay, well, we've got uh, 15, maybe a few more minutes for questions from the audience, so I'm sure you've got questions. Uh, I will lay down the rules here. Please make it a question, not a comment, and make it one question. Gentlemen in the front, first off the block. Could you please also identify yourselves and your, and your company, please? I think, do we have, sorry, and we have, we have some, some microphones? microphones. Sure. Anyone? Yeah, Chris, you want to take that, but the others, feel free to jump in. South, yeah. The question's whether we didn't cover South America, so any questions on South America? Yeah, so, I mean, I think um, the first point is that um, we already have a good trade deal in South America in terms of Mercosur. Um, our, our worry for this year is um, that Mercosur may fall to pieces. So worsening relations between Argentina and Brazil, who at the end of the day are the hub 
of that deal, um, you know, the, the, the kind of antagonism we've seen between both, both countries um, could put that at risk. Um, that deal's already shrunk down once with um, effectively Venezuela being, being jettisoned. Um, the good news is obviously that um, you know, this push towards a trade deal between the EU and the Mercosur region uh, could bolster trade there. Um, one of the things I, I always struggle with is um, how we stitch together these different trade deals. So, you know, um, if we're looking at Mercosur EU, how does that fit together with EU trade deals with the US, US trade deals with members of, of Mercosur as well? How do you get rid of the, um, the, the inconsistencies that are, that are in there? Um, I think also the, the, the point I make with, with, with South America generally as well is, you know, whilst it's one continent, it's certainly not one view. So, you know, Chile and Peru have been very willing to get involved in um, Pacific regional deals to, you know, really um, look to their east, I got that right? west, look to their west <laughs> um, in terms of um, where there are other deals to be done. So, you know, I think there's definitely work to do within um, South America in terms of solidifying and improving trade ties. Um, and there's lots of opportunities in terms of new, new deals to be, um, to be done there. Um, I'd also just add, add very briefly, and we talked about it in our, our outlook, um, but I think um, I'm excited to see the opportunities coming from the new African uh, free trade area. I think that's, you know, we didn't put um, uh, Africa directly up on this uh, chart. It's a sad fact that there's not enough trade either within Africa or between Africa and other uh, parts of the world. I think it's incumbent upon the United States, upon the European Union, to address what China's done in terms of effectively <laughs> debt diplomacy mm -hmm. and try and bring kind of a rules-based trading system there. And there's finally, I think, after 20 years of negotiation, a coalition of the willing to improve trade in that region. And you know, trade lifts people up. We've seen that um, in the chart that Josh showed um, with the way that um, econ uh, economic growth has come at the same time as trade growth. I think there's a lot more to be done there. That applies to the developing economies of Latin America. It applies to the developing economies of Africa. Just on that point, yeah, please so go ahead. Yeah. our committee just met with the uh, president of Kenya mm. uh, to, just to, to begin talks about uh, bilateral agreement uh, with the United States and Kenya. And we also met um, with the speaker of Ethiopia. So as you indicate, there's tremendous opportunity uh, for uh, trade and the United States really needs to increase our uh, partnership and investment based on China's influence, obviously, in Africa, which is uh, of growing concern. Mm. Yeah, I wanted to just circle back on the gentleman's question very quickly. If I put on my old Asia chief economist hat, um, most of the Latin American countries or South American countries now have China as their biggest trading partner. And Satya mentioned earlier some of the trade diversion from soybeans. So there's been a soybean export boom from uh, Brazil and I guess to a lesser extent Argentina as China's re res uh, resourced them from Latin America rather than the US. So that might be a negative. And um, Chile is actually one of the countries that's most exposed to Chinese growth these days. So we just did an exercise with uh, coronavirus shock and outside of um, Asia, the one country that shows up on the, on the radar screen is Chile because it's very open, very exposed to China, one commodity essentially, which is copper. So if Chinese industrial production changes, Chile of all countries takes one of the biggest hits in the world. So something yeah, so, Totally. Okay. I think, I mean, just if yeah, I may that's just that's okay. bounce off that. So the, the response was, you know, how do, how do you think about South America as a resource or a manufacturing center? There was an interview uh, done at um, Davos with, um, I think it's the Chilean trade minister, who basically said, we recognize we've got this issue in copper. And similarly, we've written a lot of research about Chile and Brazil and the fact that they can be tripped over by these shocks. Actually, diversifying economies is much more difficult than just saying, you know, if willing made it so. Um, encouraging businesses to go there is phenomenally difficult. And yeah. um, to a certain extent, it's incumbent on those economies to, to liberalize themselves as well. And, you know, we talked a lot about um, India in our research. We saw the chart earlier. I think one of the challenges India has faced is by having such a, um, a bureaucratic, tariff-led uh, trade policy, it's almost held itself back. So, you know, I think for any of the South American countries to take that as a, a cautionary tale as well. Any other questions? Gentleman here in the pink shirt. Uh, got a microphone. Yeah, just our microphones in the. Okay, <laughs> the microphones are on the edges. We'll get them in the middle. <laughs> okay. Ed Campbell, QMA. 
uh, hopefully tangential questions are allowed. I was going to ask uh, Stephen to uh, handicap what's going to happen in Nevada next week. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you next Saturday. <laughs> um, the early uh, indications in the polling leading up to tomorrow, uh, Biden uh, has had uh, a lead uh, in the polling. He was up uh, at one time uh, uh, as many as, uh, as high as 10 percentage points over Bernie Sanders. Uh, I think it's definitely closed and it's, it's probably um, uh, pretty even. Uh, but Joe Biden is very well known in Nevada, obviously, uh, as the vice president. He, he um, was in the state a lot with President Obama during the eight years uh, of, of that administration. Uh, one of the most important issues in our state is uh, Yucca Mountain and the storage of high-level nuclear waste, uh, which is in my district. And uh, the Obama administration was the first administration to, to kill that project. Uh, as well as health care, which continues to be an ongoing issue. Uh, so, um, you know, my, my, my inclination is that uh, Biden will do pretty well. I don't know if uh, that means he'll win it outright, uh, but I, I think he'll, he'll come out uh, pretty strong compared to uh, the two other states. And, and one of the reasons is because Nevada really does reflect the diversity of um, of America, what we are today and what we will continue to be in the years to come. Uh, my district, for example, is uh, just over 50% uh, white, 30% uh, uh, Latino, 15% uh, African American, and about 5% uh, uh, Asian American uh, Pacific Islander. Uh, and again, in my rural communities, I've got a lot of tribal uh, uh, citizens and, and people who will also participate uh, in this caucus. So the results, I think, will be different, partly because of the diversity of our state and the issues that matter more in Nevada than they may matter in other places. Okay. Um, Next question, sorry. Yes, um, on okay. China, the purchases, Andrew G, uh, Stonebridge Capital, um, the China trans uh, purchases. Uh, what what do you what does the administration want them to purchase, and what is the best outcome for this trade agreement if they can reach that? Sure, I can take. I can take Anyone? Numbers. Yeah. Go yeah. Or okay. take turn. yeah. Yeah. So I think within the um, within the phase one uh, trade deal, the um, the USTR um, and and if nothing else, um, Ambassador Lighthizer is a technician. Um, of the law um, is very clearly laid out um, with all of the tariff codes, so as a, a way of working out which products which, um, very specific uh, buckets of what needs to be uh, bought. At the detail level, clearly, the administration is not getting involved in, well, we'd really like China to buy some more Cadillacs. You know, we want more cars to be bought. What sort of cars they are is kind of up to Chinese consumers um, to a certain extent. Um, when you bucket it out, um, as again, coming back to that chart we showed earlier, um, the, the biggest area of potential growth in absolute terms is um, manufactured goods. Um, I think there's certainly a lot of room in the aerospace industry, but the Chinese government has to decide whether it wants to help Boeing over COMAC, the, the Chinese state uh, uh, aircraft manufacturing company that's trying to get the C919 off of the ground. Um, similarly, do you want to buy a Boeing 737 MAX? You know, it's a, a, you know, it's a, a difficult question at the moment. Um, the other big area is energy. Um, in terms of percentage growth, um, effectively a fourfold increase in Chinese purchases of American energy. That's including um, oil, uh, and that's including liquefied natural gas. And there are questions being asked actually about whether um, America could produce enough, quickly enough, to satisfy that demand. Now, on the basis of our numbers, um, if you redirect all of the oil and all of the LNG being exported from the US, including growth in LNG terminals, new ones being brought online, if you point all those boats at Shanghai, you can get the job done. And that means, to the point made earlier about diversion, that oil from other places is going to go to um, you know, uh, different markets. Is that practical or not? Our, our colleagues at S&P Global Platts will tell you not, oil is, not all oil is the same. They've got quite a nice map of all of the different oil grades. And you know, the oil that's coming out of the ground in, in the US um, you know, isn't necessarily suited to all of the refineries that are in China. So there's always 
it's complicated, but manufactured goods is one, um, uh, uh, energy is the second. The third, as I mentioned earlier, is services. And I think um, from a practical perspective, that's going to mean financial services. You know, technology services, this trade war started because of technology, right? So, you know, letting Google in and letting um, American companies inside the, the great firewall is not going to happen. Tourism, I think, unfortunately, with COVID-19 happening, you know, the attractions of going to China as a tourist destination are probably a little bit less um, than they were, certainly for the, for the next year or two. Um, but it really, it really does need to come down to, um, to financial services. And um, yeah, there's an exciting opportunity there, um, as, I, as I mentioned, for banks, insurance companies, and indeed um, firms like ourselves. But the magnitude, the ambition of, of the numbers is, is, you know, is difficult to reconcile. Anyone else on the panel want to take that one up? Congressman? And to add, we have the agricultural sector as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was going to say, yeah, we always talk about soybeans and, yeah. and so on. We can kind of take those as, as and well. From, I guess, yeah. from what I understand, we had a bad planting season. Yeah. So it's going to be more difficult as a capacity to provide. Yeah. And I guess, Congressman, your district is um, you know, strong in copper, um, right, yeah. strong in healthcare, strong in electronics. Uh, we wrote a report, I won't ambush you with the numbers, we wrote a report <laughs> just today actually looking at a, a breakout of how trade has developed. I think, you know, um, Nevada's probably had a couple of challenging years from the trade war, um, but clearly it's got its part to do in terms of this new selling process. Well, and that's what's so great, honestly, about uh, the information that Panjiva uh, has provided and, and the data analysis that you all do, and, and Josh and the team. I, 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 as a member of Congress, I, I really appreciate it because uh, obviously this is a lot of complicated uh, information, and when we're debating uh, trade policy, we always want to know what it means to our state and our districts. And uh, one of the reports that you all provided me provided me a level of analysis that I had never uh, been able to get, even from uh, some of my uh, local uh, businesses and companies. So thank you. It was not a commercial panel, just to let you know. Okay, <laughs> but thank you for the plug very much, uh, Congressman. Any, what's the next question, anyone? Let me, let me, ask, let me kill time. Yeah, anyone on the panel can ask a question to yeah, the rest great. of the panel. That's so, um, Congressman, you mentioned earlier, um, I'm a bit of a trade policy wonk, so I'm going to apologize to everyone else in the room on this. You mentioned that, um, to a certain extent, uh, Congress needs to exercise more oversight. Mm -hmm. Do you think that requires new primary legislation? Um, how, how, do you, how do you bring an administration to account, mm -hmm. yeah, whether, whether it's Trump to or you know, the next Democratic president. How, how do we do that? Well, uh, it doesn't matter who the president is. Let me start there, because yeah. there were uh, disagreements with Ob uh, President Obama and TPP. So right there, there needs to be a, a, a level set yeah. on trade policy uh, altogether. I think the example of USMCA really showed us, though, that there's opportunities for Congress to really drill down on the specifics of a deal. Yeah. Um, and uh, the enforceability provisions, which we really did demand in the USMCA as a great example, they weren't in there. Mm. They were talked about uh, broadly, uh, but they, they were not provided with any great t detail. Uh, we were able to um, prevent the uh, exclusivity uh, provisions around uh, pharmaceuticals mm. and biologics, which was a very important issue to a number of our uh, more progressive members that had we not gotten that stricken, they would not have ultimately voted for the trade deal. I mean, you've got people like Rosa DeLauro and Jan Chukowski who had really never supported a trade deal. They voted for USMCA mm -hmm. because of the protections we got for environment, for, for workers, and um, for consumers around uh, the pharmaceutical uh, exclusivity. So, that, to me, is a model for how mm. we should be approaching future deals and for how we work with the administration. Again, I give credit to Ambassador Lighthizer. He came in to our committee, um, the Ways and Means Committee, as well as to the House Democratic Caucus more than 10, 20 times to give briefings along the way. Um, and yeah, they wanted to kind of speed it up towards the end because they thought we were getting in the window of the election period where maybe Congress wouldn't act. Um, and we were resistant to being forced to vote on something until we thought it was ready. But ultimately, the deal that was voted on 
um, and which will be implemented is a much stronger deal because we work together to get it done. And I hope that it is an example for how we can uh, approach future trade agreements. Thank you. Great, last chance for questions from the audience, the gentleman there in the middle. Thanks. Uh, my name is Sankar from uh, Node LB. This question is for Congressman. I think you mentioned before that uh, Ways and Means Committee is uh, working on some kind of tax incentive for renewable. Could you please elaborate on that? So uh, the subcommittee chairman, Mike Thompson, uh, over um, revenue is putting together a package of, of, of tax incentives, right? So we've for a long time subsidized the fossil fuel industry um, through our federal tax code and, and uh, tax uh, uh, benefits. And so we want to provide a level playing field and benefits to renewable uh, sectors, particularly around electric uh, vehicles, um, around solar projects in my Home state, for example, we have a number of major solar projects which are helping us become um, a net exporter of renewable energy, actually, to surrounding states who need to meet their renewable portfolio uh, requirements. Uh, geothermal, um, I have a provision, actually, that's being proposed to give a tax incentive, uh, tax credits to the geothermal uh, sector. Um, so this, this is a package of bills that will be brought uh, before our committee for a vote sometime uh, probably in the second or third quarter of, of this year. I think um, just to play off of that, um, Eric, who you'll hear from in a minute, wrote uh, a nice piece just in the past couple of days about the impact of tariffs on development of renewable energy. So effectively, where do you make the solar panels? Mm -hmm. And you know, in the initial phase of those tariffs being implemented, it raised the costs. Right. It discouraged um, the installation of those facilities. And now I think it, it's, it's been very much worked into the costs. Unfortunately, it means that renewable energy is probably more expensive than it should have been. So it, it's that it like- passed, But it's becoming exactly. uh, on par, if not yeah. uh, more cost effective than traditional uh, energy sources, dynamic glass, for example, and energy efficiency of, of major buildings. That, that's another provision that I'm working on to get in there because these are things that are going to address climate <laughs> and sustainability, which again goes back to the first point uh, that Josh and others were making, which is any future issues around trade and, and, and globalization have to address climate. The companies that lead on this um, are, are going to be at the forefront, and we want American businesses and American workers uh, to, to both be the beneficiaries and to be the, the makers of those new um, products. Yeah, thanks very much, gentlemen. Yeah, for just speaking for the economics profession as well, I think this is just the tip of the iceberg, you know, measuring uh, environmental outcomes, scoring it, putting it into the national accounts, green GDP, all that stuff. We're going to be seeing a lot more of that. Let's thank this outstanding panel, uh, Chris Rogers, Congressman Steve Horsford, and Sachin Pandey. Nice to be on the panel with you. I'm sorry. Thank you, Paul, for uh, keeping us all on our toes. Uh, we're going to hand over now to um, our next panel, uh, moderated by Warren Breakstone, uh, looking at uh, technology and supply chain. So, Warren, if you'd like to come up. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. 20 years ago, if you wanted to purchase a, uh, a terabyte of storage, okay, it would have costed you tens of millions of dollars. Today, a terabyte of storage, you can get $10 a month on uh, Apple's iCloud, half that. Uh, on Amazon. If you were to purchase 20 years ago the equivalent of a gigahertz of processing power, it would cost you the equivalent of a uh, two-bedroom New York City apartment. Today, it's the cost of a cup of coffee. In fact, you don't even need to buy it. 
you, you can rent it from any one of the uh, major cloud providers. So dramatic changes over the past uh, uh, 20 some odd years as it relates to the pace of technology change. Storage is nearing uh, free, if you will. Processing power is quite uh, plentiful. And uh, what that's led our, our clients are uh, in all industries, in all sectors, to be able to really look to harness machines in their processes and to embrace newer technologies to help get more out of data to automate, to optimize, uh, to improve, whether it be their supply chain and related processes or take advantage of the various data opportunities out there to help them make better decisions. According to uh, uh, research from uh, Research 451, by 2024, there will be 13.8 billion uh, IoT endpoint connections. 13.8 billion. That has a profound impact, not just on the amount of new data that's being produced that needs to, needs to be harnessed, but also some really big implications uh, as it relates to security, cybersecurity, hacking, and the like. In 2017, there was a, uh, a notable casino that got hacked through a IoT-enabled thermometer in a fish tank. So if you think about the impl implications to an interconnected world and an interconnected supply chain, they are quite profound. And your weakest link in that supply chain could be and certainly becomes your greatest vulnerability. At the same time, there's just an explosion of new data. Much of it is now labeled alternative data. If you're wearing a, uh, an iWatch right now, you're, you're in the midst of creating new data. Uh, and by one report recently, 90% of the world's data has actually been created uh, in just the past two years. So this has now born an entirely new profession of data scientists. I've got three kids. I keep pushing them in this direction. It's not working. Uh, they spend their time, these data scientists, on wrangling data, trying to look for opportunities to get more out of data. Those of us in this room, most of us grew up with Excel and Lotus. These data scientists are learning Python and R that make programming languages to enable them to get more out of these uh, underlying data assets. I see a few people smiling, so maybe you're, you're already there. Uh, at the same time, supply chains are under threat from, from climate change, whether it be directly via physical risk or through regulations and carbon taxes. There are now hundreds and hundreds of new regulations related to climate sustainability, okay? And that was up 75% this past year. Our clients now need to take this seriously, and they are taking this seriously, and they have new tools to help them understand both their physical risk of their assets and their supply chain, as well as the risks associated with transitioning to a different type of climate neutral uh, environment. So with that, I'd love to introduce our panel. These are some of the topics that we'll be addressing today. So Rochelle, Eric, Brian. Great. OK. So let's start with a fun question. So I'm going to mention a few different technologies and themes and trends, and you guys tell me which ones of these we can just simply ignore because it's a fad. <laughs> okay? Sure. So uh, let's start. Digitization, blockchain, natural language processing, climate change, IoT, 5G. So which of those can we just simply ignore? What's the fad in there? Who are we starting with? <laughs> we'll start with you, Brian. First of all, I'd like to thank my new colleagues uh, at S&P for inviting me and integrating me in. I, I am clearly the new guy here 
as one of the research leaders at 451. Um, we make a business covering all those things that you mentioned. So we would be crazy to say any of those are worth ignoring, right? But I think that the right way to think about new technology innovations is to place them on maturity curves and then also match that against where your own companies are relative to their own maturity and their ability to deal with some of these technologies. Um, but you asked for an answer, so I'll give you an answer. I think that 5G is a technology that you could put on the back burner in terms of a direct impact and how it's going to uh, affect the supply chain. A lot of the sex and sizzle of 5G is a few years down the road yet. Uh, this first phase is going to be really about smartphones uh, and consumer centric. And all of the interesting uh, doodads come in release 17, which is, again, uh, a couple years to three away from commercialization. So I would put that one in the back burner. The other ones, I, I, I would say, um, uh, all need to be looked at and, and sort of placed uh, in the proper context. And I'll, and I'll get into the, more of that as we, as we move through. Right, terrific. Uh, Eric, why don't you introduce yourself? And, and, and I'm interested in hearing what you think about the comment about 5G, if you agree or disagree. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, so I'm Eric Oak. I'm a supply chain research analyst uh, with the Quantum Metal team. I work very closely with, with Chris, um, uh, with Panjiva, and, and the, the brilliant company that Josh put together. Um, in terms of 5G, um, I, I do agree with Brian that uh, we need to see some, some benefits, and really the benefits of 5G come once a, a, a large enough scale is created uh, for this to, to actually have an impact. So once an entire supply chain is, is wired with 5G, um, you might start to see some of that momentum pick up and, and the ROI um, be achieved. Uh, so that's, I would agree with Brian that it's, it's, it's a few years down the road. Good, we didn't even talk before. Right. <laughs> I was gonna say 5G, but now I'll throw something else out. Um, I'm gonna say blockchain, because as quantum computing evolves, I'm sure the um, way that blockchain is enabled is going to become obsolete. I saw the other day that quant uh, quantum enabled uh, secure messaging has been done through encapsulation. It's a really crazy thing that happens with quantum uh, mm -hmm. mechanics. So I'm gonna say blockchain. Okay, three people, three different opinions. Chris, you wanna, uh, let's bring up a poll. We'll see what the audience thinks. I'm hoping polling systems aren't one of the... <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> So just give people a, a few seconds to answer. No 5G. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so the question is, which technological developments has the most promise in 2020? It's machine learning, blockchain, Environmental impact analysis and mitigation are, are really the top three. What do you guys think of these uh, these results? I, I would actually, this is the way that I would have voted as well, and I would actually probably place them in this order. Machine learning and AI, I mean, you, you, in, in some ways, a proxy is you can look at how big our practices are around these technologies, and that would be our one of our largest. Uh, the, the implication for AI and machine learning, and really they're, they're the two of the same things, and machine learning is a part of, of the AI uh, advanced analytics. Um, you look around any corner of your organization, there are opportunities to put AI and machine learning to use. So it, it doesn't need to be about the fleet management and optimization of supply routes and supply chain. You're going to be applying this technology to fraud detection. You're going to be applying natural um, language processing to reviewing contracts for anomalies, to helping break down uh, language barriers with your partners, all the way to customer-facing capability where you're going to have you know, chatbots replacing humans. That's all AI-enabled. Um, so you know, I, I wrote a paper about six months ago that got a little bit of controversy, which is what I said was, AI and machine learning is actually going to be more impactful to the telecom sector's profit line over the next five years than 5G will be because of all the places that they can put that technology to squeeze either um, efficiency or create new, um, new revenue opportunities. So that's how I would couch that up. Yeah, I guess I could make two points to follow up on that. Um, really, any company who has loaded up Excel, made a graph, and put a trend line on that graph 
has done machine learning. So it's not that hard to get into machine learning and start to build up your capabilities today. Um, and like Brian said, there are, there are many, many places where you don't uh, right now recognize that this could be uh, an application for AI or an application for automation uh, that you can find by just digging into your processes and uh, applying uh, very basic techniques to that, uh, to that problem. Great. Well, I'm a bit biased because I work on the environmental impact analysis and mitigation. <laughs> so I'm going to say that that's really, really important. But it's going to be even more important in terms of leveraging machine learning AI to determine the patterns in the future because we really can't rely on a lot of historical data when it comes to climate. Everything is so different in the world we're emerging into. So it's going to be really important to leverage every data point we can to understand what that impact means for us in the future. You know, Rich Rochelle, I was thinking of you as, as the congressman was talking about how uh, sustainability and uh, environmental considerations need to be part of all the, the new uh, sort of discussions around trade. I'm wondering if you could talk for a minute about, you know, what, what, what that really means. What, what are some of the implications of that uh, to companies in their, their supply chain? And maybe even start with a, just a definition around what is a carbon tax? Sure. Yeah, so today there's about 46 countries and regions that have some type of carbon tax or carbon scheme. This could be emission trading schemes, it could be a fuel tax, it could be electricity tax. And these are emerging very quickly. So even in areas where you wouldn't necessarily expect a carbon tax, as in a lot of our supply chains, China now has a national uh, carbon tax. Uh, I think six or seven provinces do. Thailand is considering a mission trading scheme, as is Vietnam. Vietnam already has one. So these are areas all across the world that uh, essentially are uh, putting some price to the ton of emissions that are emitted, uh, either from utilities themselves or sites or from fuel. So a company, obviously a multinational company, is going to have sites across the globe that are already situated in these areas. So a lot of these companies are probably already paying a carbon tax that's somehow ingested in their expenses, whether they recognize it or not. And then their suppliers are going to be paying a carbon tax that probably will continue to increase. And that will be most likely passed on to the companies, which are their customers. So there's a lot of different angles from which this can impact companies, uh, both from where they're operating. So you know, obviously, Europe has quite a lot of carbon taxes. Sweden has the highest one, which is $130 per ton of emission. Um, so that operationally, but also from their supply chain and many, many countries starting to adopt them. And do you think this will just continue across the globe as, as uh, countries? I do, yeah. Them? There's um, general consensus across the economic and political science community that carbon taxes are the most effective way to really reach stabilization of the climate. Um, basically, you're pricing damage. Uh, and this damage has historically been externalized and either absorbed by the environment or the ocean <laughs> uh, or society. So um, it's basically just integrating something into our current <coughs> economic system that we can understand, which is a price. Um, do we also need other ways to, to do that? Of course. I mean, one way to lower this expense would be to get renewable energy, anything that doesn't have emissions, uh, electric vehicle fleet, et cetera. So I think we'll see a lot of this roll out more and more across the globe. And probably has also a profound impact as you think about who your suppliers are and who their suppliers are as well. Um, Eric, is there something you'd like to add to that from a, uh, from a supply chain perspective? Yeah, we can, we can talk a little bit about um, especially IMO 2020 and slow steaming, where uh, supply chains have had to adapt to new regulations. Um, companies uh, or shipping companies, logistics firms that have had to make a choice over the past few years whether they want to install scrubbers or rely on the fact that they can buy low sulfur fuel. So uh, these decisions do ripple throughout supply chains, uh, and companies do have to make decisions that will affect them uh, on a long term basis. I've been thinking a lot about the, the, the earlier commentary around IoT, and thank you for that statistic, Brian, around the 13.8 yeah. billion uh, 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 interconnected endpoints, uh, and, and, and the risk to supply chains. I mean, first, there's the advantages to supply chains maybe you can start with around that interconnectedness, but also if you can talk a little bit about the risks um, and how uh, uh, companies have to start thinking and managing and measuring those risks around, yeah. related to an interconnected uh, supply chain. So first of all, the benefit of IoT for a supply chain or frankly any type of organization, and maybe just take a step back, what is IoT? You know, it's shorthand for 
a bunch of use cases which are really about virtualizing the physical world. And in an asset intensive uh, set of industries or where you have a lot of moving assets and, and sub-parties to a chain, uh, an IoT, that, that information flowing uh, from, from IoT sensors or connected machinery creates a, a tremendous amount of, of value in terms of the insights it can bring um, whether you're optimizing your supply chain for routes or even within a warehouse and leveraging um, uh, you know, optimized machinery which are you know, automated and so forth. But every, for every node that you have, you talked about 13.8 billion, you've got uh, a, a potential ingress into your corporate network, your corporate assets. You mentioned a couple examples of the thermometer in the fish tank, which, which opened up a casino to a massive uh, data breach. Everyone remembers the target breach of 2013, which was another example where, um, and in fact, the HVAC supplier to target had access to the target network, uh, on which was also point of sale uh, suppliers, which had very rich customer um, data. So poor security practices, Party A opens a uh, bad actor to party B, and, and you know, the, the, the fun begins there. So what do you do about it? <clears throat> it requires, um, it, 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 first of all, it requires a strong understanding of what the risks are. So your CISO has to have policy um, that it ensures is enforced across multi-party and multi-actor systems. Um, there's also, you know, it, the bad guys haven't stopped. The good guys haven't either. There's, there's a lot of tools out there today, and uh, even the, some that use uh, art of AI and machine learning to get in front of even zero-day attacks. So the tools are getting there, but the first step is understand, hey, the weakest link in my chain can really cause me some serious issues. I better make sure I'm pushing on all the links to make sure they're doing the right thing. Right, and also how you choose and you know, select and evaluate your vendors and who, who's part of your uh, your You have to ecosystem. have a governance strategy there. Right, right. Eric, thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Um, really, supply chains can be a, a great place for an attacker to come in um, because you, you've already trusted that party and, and they are a third party. So like Brian said, the weakest point in your supply chain is the best place to attack. We've also seen uh, various physical risks. So I don't know how many of you remember um, the recent scare around supermicro servers having a, a chip implanted in them at the factory in China. Um, that was never confirmed. Um, and, and again, they, uh, we, we don't know what the actual status of that is at this point. Um, but that demonstrates some of the risks you have from having third parties ship things into you that you then have to inherently trust. Um, I was speaking to Brian earlier, he made a really good point that that's a great example of a task that a machine can do a lot better than a human. Um, asking somebody to look at a circuit board and tell you whether each of the transistors on it are compromised or not would be impossible. Um, but you could easily use uh, an AI uh, machine vision program to look at that board and see if it matches the specifications that you sent to your supplier. Um, so there are opportunities and technologies that we can start to leverage to try to prevent these attacks. Um, but, but in the meantime, we do have to recognize that uh, physical goods are not immune to cyber attacks. There's a, uh, there's a, I'm sorry, go ahead, Rachel. I would just add from an ESG perspective that there's also the um, problem with collecting so much data from users from IoT. Right. So you have, you know, this Apple Watch on your, on your wrist and so on. It's collecting really, really personal data. And so how is that going to be used by insurance companies, different types of companies? There's a lot of algorithmic bias that can be in some of the machine learning models that can kind of disenfranchise different parts of our community. Um, so, you know, uh, I was reading something the other day, would we want something where you smoke a cigarette in your apartment, sends that information to your employer, takes it out of your health bills, et cetera. So right. you know, these are possibilities that won't necessarily happen, but we also need regulation and more understanding of what we're gonna use this technology for and uh, also have the cybersecurity as well. Right, right, Big Brother is watching. <laughs> um, and, and that leads us to a good discussion actually around data and just uh, with all these new technologies uh, being incorporated in the supply chain and in manufacturing and in all facets of uh, organizations and, and people in, in, in consumer life. Um, it's also the generation of all of this new data and Rochelle, you just talked about some of the, uh, you know, the privacy related implications of this. Uh, what are some of the other implications? How are how are how are companies uh, uh, looking and tools and techniques to manage all of this data and try to get get uh, value out of uh, this data? 
Yeah, I could start again. So the, I, one thing I wanted to say that I haven't yet is when, you talk, when you're talking about AI and IoT and even blockchain for that matter mm -hmm. uh, and 5G, frankly, these are all reinforcing um, technologies, right? So you, you have the IoT sensor, the network piece of it is enhanced with 5G. When you have a blockchain in there, you're going to have an ability to have a trusted um, source of data that, that's immutable and that everyone can can believe it, and then, and then the, the sort of the, the fire hose of data can't be handled and, and processed by humans. So you've got AI and machine learning to help create insights from that fire hose. And you know, we had talked before too about an, another big Uber topic is edge computing, which is something that my firm is looking at closely. And, and that's really about where do we position the compute and analysis capability physically in order to do, to do the, to, to take action with this data. Because again, at the end of the day, none of this makes any sense unless you're gonna be able to create an actionable insight that adds value to your business from it. Um, so there's a lot of moving parts there. In terms of how to get your, your arms around it, what I can tell you after six years working in the IoT space is the wrong way to look at it is to start the conversation around technology and say, okay, I need a 5G network or I needed to use an Azure uh, machine learning program in the cloud, or I'm going to buy a package from, uh, from Oracle. The, the, the better way to take, that, take a look at this is say, as an organization, what are my outcomes that I seek to accomplish via a, a, a means to an end, which will be ultimately a technology decision? Um, and, and too many of the IoT projects have gotten hung up in that POC stage because they didn't take that approach. And so that approach requires you to really get consensus uh, building around the organization. Hey, what do we really think we can do? What's the low hanging fruit? What's our, what are our aspirational roadmap items? And when you start there, uh, I think you can, it, it gets you on a, a better path to be able to actually have KPIs built in that you can measure and have the sort of broad uh, amount of support required to really make these things happen. And why is that important? When you talk about IoT, when you talk about digitizing your supply chain, you're talking about breaking business processes. You know, this isn't just about technology adoption, this is about breaking existing business processes, which are the riskiest um, uh, things you can break, you can break co most cost costly things if you, if you screw up, and also culturally um, untenable in a lot of cases. Right. So you know, you, getting everyone on board on those outcomes, I think, is important, and a lot of that other stuff sort of follows suit. Right. So start start with the question. Start with the uh, business problem, not with the technology. Yeah. Sure. And then risk management being a big piece of that, and thinking about totally those implications. Rochelle, anything you'd want to add from a risk management perspective, and how uh, ESG and a focus on ESG is uh, increasingly being used as a vehicle to assess risk. Definitely. So not only is ESG helpful for exploring alpha, so it's not all about the risk, but sure. it is an excellent risk uh, management framework. So a lot of investors will actually look at ESG, environmental social governance scores, to determine how well managed a company is as a proxy for an agile and resilient company throughout time. Uh, simply because a company that can identify these risks promptly, address them, and then report transparently around them, it's probably a pretty well-managed company. So that's very helpful. And then there can be real, real risks in, related to this. So one of my favorite examples, uh, I think was around 2007, Coca-Cola actually got kicked out of a number of provinces in India because they wanted to build bottling plants, but it was taking the water from the surrounding farmers who relied on that. And it resulted in major protests uh, and, and uh, eventually got kicked out. So not only did they lose access to this market, it was a major reputational faux pas. And what they could have done, and now that they do do at every single one of the new sites they go to, is they do a thorough risk, water risk assessment. They also do a lot of stakeholder engagement to make sure that they're going to have a social license to operate in this region when they're using this region's resources. So these are the type of things that we're going to see more and more and more as a lot of these resources are more scarce and more important to businesses growing and functioning. Um, Eric, maybe I'll... I'll Change focus a little bit. I want to. I want to go to one of those other technologies, which which is uh, which is blockchain. Okay. Um, and, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna name a few companies, and I'm I'm wondering if you can comment as to why these companies uh, are really important to sort of understand. Uh, Trade Lens, Clear Metal, 
mm -hmm. some others in that space. What, what's the, what's yeah. the uh, significance of? So again, those are some companies that uh, we picked out just because we we'd written some research on them recently uh, in the 2020 outlook. Um, but there are there are many more companies out there that are doing uh, the same things and and making great advances in in supply chain transparency. Um, so TradeLens is a collaboration between IBM and Maersk, I believe, um, and they're looking to enable blockchain shipping ledgers inside of uh, US ports. So what we found uh, via Pangeva data was that uh, TradeLens had uh, a presence, so not all the data coming out of this port, but a presence in about 43% of US ports. Uh, one of our hypotheses is that for this really to pick up and to be uh, something that really changes the logistics industry, uh, they're going to need a bit more exposure than that. Um, uh, one of the things that's really important within supply chains is our, our network effects. So uh, a single company on its own uh, that does something like a blockchain may not see as many benefits as an entire industry joining the blockchain. Uh, so once a, a network starts to be built, um, we've seen this in the social media space with Facebook or Instagram, uh, that company gains a large advantage in, uh, in future operations. Uh, these network effects can have really powerful um, effects on supply chains in general. There's a concept in supply chains and supply chain analysis called whiplash, where uh, a company, a company's orders to their suppliers will change over time based on their market demands. Uh, that supplier sees orders coming in from their customer uh, that sees the market demand, but that supplier itself doesn't actually get to see that market demand uh, for themselves. So you can almost imagine this as it goes down the supply chain like a game of telephone. So at every step of the supply chain, the original consumer demand, the original consumer intent gets warped a little bit and changed. So when you get down to the raw supplier, they get what, you know, very large uh, swings in the order volume they receive because these little changes at the top of the supply chain have propagated down into uh, large and difficult to handle um, uh, complications or orders uh, at the bottom. So if you have something like a blockchain, which is distributed and trusted by third parties, uh, the parties at the bottom of the supply chain can actually look ahead and see what type of orders are coming down the chain and prepare for them in a much more transparent, open way. Um, so that's that's the kind of thing that, or the kind of benefits that companies like Tradezones or, or Clear Metal are trying to accomplish. Um, and again, they're not there yet, um, but as the network grows, uh, we should be able to see some of these advantages uh, take hold. Right, and also a major disruptor uh, in in uh, in the industry and in supply chains for sure. Uh, Brian, anything? You'd I, yeah, I wanted to add something. It, it's rare that I give Oracle uh, a compliment, but I, I will in blockchain. One of the things that's hard, it, you're, you're right on the money, right? It's all about the network effects, and and everybody needs to get on board of this. What, what is a, a technical integration, right? And so, and sh it typically there's a chief actor who, who wants to pull things together, whether it be a Walmart or um, a, a shipping company, logistics, what have you. But what Oracle has done, which I give them a lot of credit for, is they what they've made easy is for all of the people that one of the, the, the chief wants to follow them into the initial deployment, I think up to 20, they will do it for free. So they'll do all of the integration and they'll do education into those customers as to what the participation brings to them. So not just the, the, the chief, but what can I do with this intelligence? And so that has sort of, sort of started to move the needle and, I, and that's exactly what the industry needs because you need, you need that catalyst to say, okay, this is worth it for me to do, it's not gonna cost me anything, and there's ultimately long run benefits I can get. When you get those win-win-wins, then you can start to see the flywheel start to, right, to move, right. you know? So let me ask one more question before we open it up to the floor. Um, I, is there... I, sorry, can oh, I just mention Of course, question? for Don't sure. leave me out of the tack here. <laughs> you know? um, so also, just to give it a slightly different perspective, the, the blockchain, although I was ranting earlier, but it is good. Um, it can be really, really helpful for supply chain transparency. Right. So um, when we think of conflict minerals, for example, uh, minerals in different 
um, elements that are mined in areas with child labor, forced labor, et cetera. Uh, diamonds can be that. I mean, I'm sure you've all seen Blood Diamond, for example. So I know there's a company, Everledger, that uses blockchain to make sure that the diamond that you're buying for your engagement ring or whatever is you know, not from those areas, and you are not supporting that type of labor. And so that's an excellent use of that. Yeah. Also with fishing, you know, I think it's about 90% of our fish stocks today are near depletion, <laughs> if not severely compromised. There's a project called Providence that's looking to make sure that um, the tuna that is bought is not from these areas that are supposed to be protected to allow the fish stocks to replenish. So these are excellent ways that we can actually stabilize future resources and commodities and supplies, um, as well as you know, contributing to kind of a, a more ESG and, and yeah, equitable society using blockchain as well. Yeah, so using blockchain to, to really understand the source of goods and materials and, uh, and the like, yeah. And th that I can see becoming increasingly important for, for investors as well as they're looking to make sure that their portfolios do or do not have these types of uh, uh, you know, various uh, goods and services or components that are, that, are, uh, that, that, that are not consistent with what their approaches or values or, or, or the like. Or quality or quality for that matter. I think that it's especially important in industries like with perishable goods and foodstuffs as they move through. If you have one batch that goes bad and you're a big uh, food distributor, a blockchain that everyone agrees to is immutable and, and transparent would allow you to be able to pinpoint the source of the spoil and, and potentially wouldn't take your entire brand down and, and your entire operation mm -hmm. because you'd be able to, to agree to, hey, here, here's the issue, we've been able to, to stop it. Not to rehash um, the blocks here, but um, one of the great things, <laughs> sorry, I had to. Um, uh, one of the great things about this concept and proves, it proves the power of this idea is that services are coming out, um, and not to play favorites or anything, but I think Amazon has one called Quantum Ledger, um, which they caveat, this is not a blockchain, but it provides the same uh, trusted uh, kind of ledger or database capability that a blockchain does if you're willing to trust Amazon. So if you're willing to trust, if everybody's willing to trust a third party, you can oftentimes get a lot of the benefits of a blockchain without a blockchain. Um, so I think that proves that this idea of, of transparency and trust between third parties is really powerful, um, that people are, are you know, reinventing the wheel and making blockchains that aren't blockchains just to, to serve this market. And Rochelle, to add on that, what, what are some of the technologies and tools that our customers are using to um, to really evaluate and assess their supply, their their suppliers. Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, it's a really, really exciting time because previously we've kind of been reliant on, say, surveys or uh, modeling for supply chain, things that aren't quite as direct. But as certain things like the I IoT and more communications evolve, you can get a real sense of what's happening. I was super excited by that H&M nodal map that you showed because mm -hmm. it's showing, you know, uh, if we could overlay that with some ESG risks, you could really get a differentiation of kind of what suppliers would you want to work with, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I know from digging around with some of the Pangeva data, you can look at Walmart suppliers, for example. And I've, I've heard through the cracks that a lot of clients, companies will actually see what suppliers Walmart has, because Walmart has a very, very stringent procurement. Uh, they ask for emissions and water and social practice and everything as a proxy for reliable suppliers. So it's very interesting. I think that could be a really helpful source um, of re reliability for a lot of companies. All right, interesting. So uh, I'll ask one more and then we'll open it up to the floor, which is, you know, we talked a lot about all these different technologies and I'm reminded of a, of a great quote, which I'll, I'll, I'll revise a little bit for this audience, but um, uh, a, a machine will always beat a person, but a person with a machine will always beat a machine. And with all these new technologies and tools and capabilities uh, and approaches, um, we talked earlier around the advent of all these data scientists and that there are more data scientist roles than data scientists. This quest for uh, attracting and retaining these type of talented folks to be able to, to do exactly what the three of you have described and to use and apply these different tools and technologies. It, it, it must be a challenge. So uh, how are folks, um, how are folks uh, approaching sort of the, 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 the talent challenge? Yeah, well, well, I, yeah, we'll go, uh, we'll please, please go ahead. I, I was just going to say, our data tells us a pretty clear story here. So, um, you know, big companies with, with major resources in their IT organizations, um, investment in these advanced technologies, mm -hmm. and I would put also on that table cloud native, so that transformation, the, the, the evolution to agile, cloud native, DevOps friendly, right. but also 
uh, data set side, I mean, th these people cost a lot of money, but if your organization has bet big and is viewed as a technical innovator, that's attractive to new grads. Mm -hmm. so, so first of all, 75% of people that we uh, talk to in our survey as a general populace are raising their hand and saying, yeah, we're, we see this challenge and we're going to staff up internally and build the skills to be able to consume the open source platforms and tools around these advanced technologies, the, what the, the hyperscalers are, are putting on offer from Amazon to Google to, uh, to AWS. But there, there's a minority, a good 25, 30%, who will just say, no, can't do it. I expect my core suppliers of supply chain management tools, of my building management tools to build that in, and I will consume uh, in a very low code, low touch way, hey, that, that's just, I expect that to be built into the experience with those applications. So there's, both of those are happening. Well, the employee experience as well is, is so pertinent to, uh, as we think about uh, ESG and the, uh, and that particularly the millennials, but not just the millennials, are eager to also work for companies that have these sorts of values uh, in their principles and in their behavior. Uh, Rochelle, maybe you talk a little bit about that as well. Sure. So fortunately, ESG is in a great position today that a lot of people really want to have a purpose to their, to their work and a mission. And obviously, you know, getting behind the climate challenge and a lot of environmental and social issues is, is really close to a lot of people's core values. Um, you know, you see this in terms of the major switch in the uh, transfer of wealth that's happening, for example, between baby boomers and the millennials. And all of the major financial institutions, and, and one of the reasons why S&P is so into this as well, is that millennials really want to invest their money in alignment with ESG values and in companies they actually you know, believe are doing good. And, and we need to have the data and the insights to be able to provide that, et cetera. So, you know, young people also want to work for companies that are doing good things and, and want to do it. Um, but I do also think that things are, are quite complex these days. There's a major domain expertise that is needed for a lot of ESG things, for, for technology, for supply chain, et cetera. And so I think what we'll see a lot is people providing, you know, everyone can use a laptop, but not everybody knows how to program and code. So who can create those tools, those interfaces, those ways that can be translation points between all of the different elements that we're trying to put together? And how can we make that interesting for people and, and fun and, and give them the autonomy and innovative capacity mm -hmm. to build that? So yeah, I think those are things that will, that will come up as well. Eric, can you do that? Yeah, I guess just to add on, and I don't want to step too much on the S of ESG, yeah, but uh, one of the things, and I think there was a, a study that's been quoted so much that I can't remember who, who actually said it, but about 40% of every job can be automated. Um, and so I think that puts into context the fact that when you think of automation, you really shouldn't be thinking about a robot doing everything. You should be thinking about a robot doing 40% you know, of something. But what that means is scale, and I highly recommend, uh, if you've never been to like, an automotive plant or any other highly automated manufacturing facility to, to do that, is that you don't have people um, you don't have people replaced fully, but you have people enhanced with tools and other uh, robots or, or et cetera that let them do their jobs better. And so it's a productivity enhancer, but unfortunately what that means from the social side is that there are going to be some things that fall by the wayside. So, and again, uh, stealing things from research by much smarter people than I am, um, one of the jobs that they predict in the future is a robot manager. So somebody whose job is to manage robots working in a factory or in a business. And again, when you think of robot, don't think of a physical thing. Think of a computer program um, that's acting like a human. Um, so having the technologies and the, the skills and the, the capabilities to use these type of programs and these type of um, technologies is going to be increasingly important. And I think companies have the ability to lift up their employees um, to tackle these new things and hopefully get some productivity gains uh, off the top. Yeah, that's great. So let's open it up to some questions. See Who wants to be a robot manager? <laughs> yeah. I think I might already be. <laughs> or work for a robot manager. Does anyone work for a robot manager? <laughs> <laughs> um, what is your data, or is your data able to project the impact of the coronavirus on 2020 global supply chains. That's good. Eric, why don't you take that one? Yeah, we can take that. And we've written, um, we've written uh, numerous pieces uh, trying to look at that exact question. Um, 
So one of the things that we've seen with coronavirus, um, luckily we're in earnings season right now, so we get um, real-time kind of answers from executives on those questions. So we've seen, um, I know Under Armour, uh, I think predicted a 1% trim in revenue from coronavirus. Um, Nintendo said that they were expecting production delays. Um, and, and all these questions, uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna warn you, I'm gonna say it depends, but in a much longer fashion. Um, there are kind of one thing going for, for the current um, crisis is that it did strike during uh, Lunar New Year. So companies were already prepared to have a supply chain disruption, the one that comes every year in, in, in January and February. Uh, so th I don't want to say they were ready for it, but it was a continuation, almost a continuation or an unexpected um, extension of Lunar New Year. So what we're seeing and, and what um, kind of the research Christian and I has wrote is that companies that have uh, more just-in-time supply chains are at the, the most risk uh, for disruption. So if you're expecting that shipment of uh, car parts to come in from China today and it doesn't and your factory shuts down, uh, you're in trouble. Luckily, um, uh, companies that have just-in-time supply chains are normally very savvy on the procurement side, so they will have um, looked through some of these single source risks and have alternate suppliers. Um, but as we kind of move down the, uh, the, the supply chain uh, into companies that do hold more inventories, um, we might see more disruption as, as critical components start to go missing. Um, I guess the final thing I'll say about coronavirus is that um, the risk here is that uh, when we have things coming from China on, on ships, so maritime shipments from China, there is a, a three to four week lead time uh, in those inherently. So once stocks have been depleted, um, we will need to wait for that lead time to repopulate the channel uh, before companies can get their, their, their components. So that's the big risk, is that uh, coronavirus should be cured tomorrow, but because of the lead times inherent in, in maritime shipping, um, there will still be potential disruptions um, uh, down the pipe. Do, do you anticipate that, that there are lasting effects e even once it, it runs its course, that supply chains may May uh, folks may be thinking about their supply chains differently or, or, or making various decisions, or is it just a blip and it'll all come back to normal at some point? So again, that's hard to say um, without knowing, uh, being in, sitting in C-suites and, and listening mm -hmm. to conversations. But um, again, some of the things that our research has already found is that supply chains have been moving out of China to begin with. And so Josh, Josh talked on that um, previously. And so while uh, companies do need to scramble to find alternative suppliers, um, uh, coronavirus isn't doesn't discriminate against uh, just Chinese suppliers. So um, as we go, these type of existential risks to supply chains or, or, or commerce as a whole uh, are going to be uh, things that companies need to pay attention for risk analysis. Um, but I think the, the overall macro picture probably won't be changed much by coronavirus specifically um, as much as, as uh, other pressures uh, like, again, trade wars, politics, um, uh, the cost of wages, um, et cetera. Great. Other questions? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> terrific panel. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, I'm Philip Burke. I work at Apache Capital. This question, I guess, is probably more for uh, uh, Rochelle. Uh, it's an ESG question. Um, so the, there's, a, there's a quite a wide gap on the investment management side between what investors in ESG fund think ESG funds are doing and what ESG funds really are doing, mm. right? So investors look at, you know, literature and they see words like, uh, you know, global warming, environmental destruction, you know, destruction of species, that sort of thing, pollution. And they think if they invest in a fund that is managed according to ESG principles or guidelines, that they're going to have a positive impact on the environment. Then if you actually look at the other side of the ledger, you're finding that managers are looking for things like um, you know, risk to, in their supply chain to you know, maybe lack of access to water. Is it a um, material risk? Should they change the discount factors on their cash flow you know, discounting to calculate how much you should invest? Is there a risk? And then they make allocations according to that. So it really has nothing to do with saving the environment. To be a little cynical, it's all about you know, can we find yet another way to make as much money as possible while we continue destroying the planet? And so there's a really wide gap here, which, as, as I'm sure you know, there's this growing chorus of people who think that ESG is just greenwashing. And so I'm just wondering if you could look ahead a year or two, 
for us and give us a sense. How do you see that gap closing? Do you think eventually investors will simply just move away from ESG and think that it's just, you know, deception? Do you think, alternative two, do you think managers will stop marketing ESG funds as funds that will have anything to do with saving the environment? Because, right, I mean, trading secondary shares of a company that has good ESG factors is about as valuable to the environment as trading, you know, credit derivatives in the emerging market. It doesn't do any good, right? So do you think that will ch that'll change, or do you think the SEC will come in and start cracking heads? How, how do you see this evolving? I'd be curious to know what your thoughts are. Oh, and by the way, just one more point. I don't think S&P or TrueCost uh, is doing anything wrong. I think you guys are uh, all along made it clear what it is you're providing, and there's no deception there. No, I totally get where you're coming from. And um, it's true. I mean, a lot of fund advisors have taken advantage of the fact that ESG can be sold at a premium, green bonds can be sold at a premium, and haven't necessarily looked behind the numbers and seen, OK, what is this actually doing? However, I would caveat that uh, when we think of positive impact, we need to be, um, well, first of all, investing in companies that have a really bad carbon intensity, for example. So this is going to be the amount of emissions per million dollar of revenue generated, or even their general footprint. If you're investing in those companies that have a lesser footprint or a better efficiency ratio, you are having less of an impact. And you're not putting capital into companies that are, having, uh, that are emitting quite a lot, let's say you know, fossil fuel, mining, et cetera. I'd also like to level set and acknowledge that none of us are a no food -itarian. You know, just by existing, we're going to have a negative impact on the planet. The point is to have a sustainable impact, one that's not overusing our resources, and we're using them efficiently and sustainably. So when we talk about positive impact, we not only need to think about a different way to account for that in terms of the numbers, in terms of how we value you know, having jobs, having you know, better health, uh, better access to education, better access to finance, et cetera, but we also need to recognize that no company operating cannot have some impact on the environment or on social structures. It's just unrealistic. So, you know, these are things that I think need to, to, to level set in that way. But you have an excellent point. I think a really good example, mm, maybe, well, I actually don't have one, but conceptually run with me. So let's say back in the day there was some item that everyone was like, oh, this is the most sustainable item. Let's say a reusable coffee cup, so to speak. And everyone was really into it. And they're like, oh, I love this coffee cup. But then someone did a life cycle assessment on it. And they got some data together. And they looked at it. And they realized, actually, this coffee cup has all these like plastic derivatives. And you know, it, it's, made of this, um, it's made of bamboo that's really water intensive. And it's not really sustainable. And so the reason I bring this example is as there's more data available and as data becomes more standardized and more comparable, we actually can quantify what has negative impact, what has a more positive impact than others. So you're certainly right. Historically, there has been this you know, leverage that's been taken to you know, advertise ESG funds as something that's super beneficial when, in fact, it may not be. But the fact of the matter is we are consistently moving towards a period in a couple years from now where we'll be able to say quantitatively and data-drivenly with the help of many other firms such as, such as these guys up here that you know, this is a company that is, has different variants of risk, this is a company that is beneficial to our economies and society and the environment, et cetera. So don't give up. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, another question for you, Rochelle. I'm wondering your thoughts on, I guess, where we are five, 10 years later, this transition of wealth, right? Everyone thought millennials are gonna come along, take their parents' money that they inherit and put it into ESG or what was impact investing. Uh, and I know True Cost used to do natural capital assessments and all that for companies. Not sure if you still do. Um, just wondering how much you've seen the growth of that. Uh, you know, everyone thought it was really promising and everyone was going to be, be doing it. And I know every couple of years we're looking and going, it's not really happening. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious where we are now. 
Sure. Well, I really want to follow up with Paul Grimwald when he talked about green GDP and green counting. I did my thesis about that, about natural capital counting. I'm like, yes, let's do it. Let's get in there. Um, but yeah, it's a great point. I will say there's a number of really cool projects on the horizon where we're tying in uh, these factors into credit card transactions. So there's a number of credit card companies that actually want to show your footprint, want to show your uh, SDG, Sustainable Development Goals alignment, based on your purchases. Because you know this, you know the the bond that ties us all together, whether we like it or not, is is commerce and is finance, and we make changes with our money and where capital is going. And so I think more and more you'll start to see these connections start to happen uh, as you know the market gets more excited about these projects and, and are willing to, to fund them and put money into them, and as the culture kind of evolves in its understanding of how important these elements are. Uh, I think 2019 was a really seminal year in terms of you know the wildfires and uh, Larry Fink and his letter and you know so many different environmental and social disasters uh, that are happening that are really emerging in the, in the consciousness that we have to really you know, integrate this into our daily actions. And I think a lot of the institutions and financial institutions are getting really serious about that integration. So five years from now, I'd say we, we hopefully, and I believe we would make a lot of traction. Rochelle, can I just ask you a question? What's in it for the consumer in that context? I, I haven't heard yeah. about those programs. I, so are they, are you, is it gonna be gamified? So I'll get things if, I'm, mm -hmm. if I have less impact? So I think a lot of it speaks to the need to um, feel like there is some, they have some agency Control, yeah. and they're able to do something. And there's some research coming out showing that you know, every dollar you invest in you know, an ESG or some type of uh, sustainable investment has five times the impact of any type of daily activity, so like composting or whatever. And I think people are just needing a way to really align it. And if we think about it, this is a way that the entire world could start to channel capital and funds into decisions that are in alignment with a sustainable economy. Um, so, you know, like, I think traditionally the environmental movement's like, don't do anything and, you know, uh, just eat this and don't have any impact. But to be realistic, we have to integrate sustainable decisions into the system we have today. And through that is, is translating through the data and through the finances. Um, so I think from the consumer angle, it really is just, just wanting to make a difference and, and also you know wanting to make sure things are going to be OK in the future. I mean, right. I've got some friends who are like, I don't know if I'm going to have kids. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you know, it's, it's also kind of, uh, yeah, just, just having that contribution. And it all starts with the data. The data is the foundation, right? So that you can incorporate that into your decision making and make the decisions based on uh, those sorts of inputs. So uh, yeah. for sure. Uh, maybe one final and then we'll conclude. Hi, I'm Alex with Rosenblatt Securities. Uh, question on blockchain uh, efforts like TradeLens. You said they have about a 43% presence in the US ports. Uh, what kind of presence would you need in the U.S. and maybe internationally among the ports, do you think, to get that critical mass you were talking about? Oh, a good question. Yeah, that's a really good question um, and a really hard question that I don't really have a good answer to. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's something that I'm sure um, network theorists have, have put a lot of work into. But what I think the biggest thing with the blockchains are is, is you need to have complete supply chains. So if somebody doesn't participate in the network, then the network's going to be weakened. Um, and there's, there are concepts about node removal and other uh, um, network analysis uh, uh, jargon we could get into in terms of um, how, you, uh, how you view a network uh, and the robustness of the network. Um, but I think the key is, again, uh, having a complete supply chain where uh, everyone in the network is participating and trusts the process. Um, because if, if there is a gap, um, and you can see this, I think a great example of this would be um, the, uh, the, the Port of Philadelphia, um, uh, Customs intercepted a shipment of drugs in the Port of Philadelphia um, that came in through a cargo ship. Um, the cargo ship, the supplier and the consignee um, were, not, you know, were not the parties there. Um, some people actually boarded the container ship at sea um, and put the drugs on, into the containers. So if you think of that as, as a gap in the network right there, so the the, the opportunity for uh, an attack, for, per se, or, or for malfeasance comes from where there is no visibility. So uh, for the network to be, to be um, powerful and truly make a difference, it does need to have um, a complete visibility, which again does then bring up you know, social and ESG and governance issues. So um, that's, uh, it's, a, it's a problem and a, an answer that 
that we're going to find out, I think, in the next few years. Yeah, I would just to piggyback off on that, it is a really interesting balance, I think. And on the other end, I know, um, I think a couple of years ago, uh, Nestle supply chain got, you know, um, exposed essentially through satellite data, and they unfortunately had forced slave labor in their tuna uh, off of Thailand that goes into their pet food Purina uh, brand, so or line of business. So that was an instance where this kind of you know full transparency and full um, view on the supply chain really helped in, in, in dealing with that issue. But yeah, there are other privacy things that, that mm -hmm. we have yet to really figure out. So I think some of the key themes, right? Transparency in the supply chain, both from an ESG, but, but also from other risk sort of perspectives is, is very key. Space is moving very, very quickly. Uh, technology, the, uh, the, the, the rapid pace of evolution around technology has triggered all sorts of new complexities, uh, including talent and, and being able to find those types of people who can, who can really harness these different technologies. Underpinning all of this is this explosion of data, this explosion of data, which is both an asset but also somewhat of a challenge for, for customers, uh, large and small, to be able to sort of grapple with and to incorporate into their uh, decision-making processes. So with that, why don't I say thank you. Uh, we appreciate the time. Thank you to our panelists. Terrific. Rochelle, Eric, Brian. Cheers. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very Chris. Well Thanks. Cheers. Thanks, Rochelle. Thank you. Okay, sit down. We haven't finished yet. <laughs> um, before, before I get told off, uh, there's a survey on your chair. If you can fill that in. Uh, before you go, I think there's an incentive if you fill it in. It's a Starbucks coffee card. Yeah, okay, great. So there's a coffee card out there. Um, I think it's one per, by the way. It's not a, a competition to win it. Um, I want to thank everybody who has taken part today. I want to thank uh, all of you for coming along. Um, Josh, uh, I want to particularly thank you, uh, all the support you've given to uh, the research operation at Panjiva. Um, I want to thank uh, Paul and the uh, guys from the first panel. Um, and, uh, and to Warren uh, uh, for the tech panel. I think to wrap it up, you know, we, we called this outlook, um, it's about time. And uh, I think it was Josh said, what the devil does that mean? And it means a lot of different things. I think, you know, it, it's time that we actually started thinking about, um, you know, making peace in trade relations rather than just focusing on trade war. And we had illustrations in the first panel um, about um, opportunities that there are to do deals and to do proper deals that, um, you know, are fully reflective of all of stakeholders in international trade. Um, it's time to start including um, environmental considerations. Um, and, uh, you know, as, a, as I said in the, the panel with Congressman Horsford, you know, I'm very humbled by that reminder that we've got to think about the impact on people, about the workers that are in there, because um, ultimately they're going to inform the uh, politicians who are going to decide what happens with um, international policy. Um, it's about time to include uh, deeper data-driven uh, decision-making rather than just opinion decision-making. And you know, we're certainly here at S&P Global to help our customers um, do that. Um, but right now, it's about time to wrap up. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for coming along. Please do fill in your surveys. And uh, we hope to see you again at our next S&P Global event. Thank you very much.